Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us bright and early on Sunday. Uh, we'll just wait for a couple of minutes so that we get a chance, uh, give everyone a chance to join in, and then we'll start. Okay, so uh, shall we start? Yeah. Hi, good morning. So I'm Purnima on behalf of Park. I welcome you all on the Sunday morning for this great interactive session uh, to celebrate uh, Borderline Personality Month. And uh, just to start with an introduction of Park. So Park is an organization which delivers um, uh, delivers educational programs and training programs to upskill mental health professionals and to upskill even healthcare professionals in mental health. And we curate both online and offline uh, courses for uh, not only healthcare workers, but also mental health professionals. And it has been founded by Dr. Shresha Bagadia, who is a psychiatrist, family therapist, and empathy practitioner, and Pavitra Jairaman, who is who is a journalist by profession and uh, is uh, takes care of all the operations and communications. Um, yeah, so I'll start with introducing our moderator of the panel, who is Dr. Shresha Bagadia. So she's also a co-founder of uh, the Green Oak Initiative, which is a community mental health uh, center based out of Bangalore. Uh, she has been trained in UK and Australia and um, as is a trained family therapist and holds her expertise not only in family therapy but also in perinatal mental health and borderline personality disorder. So she uh, she's an MBT practitioner and also supervises MBT uh, people who are actually practicing MBT and learning MBT. And uh, she is going to be the moderator and she's going to actually take care of the panelists. And uh, I, before I hand over uh, the stage to Dr. Ashtesha, so some ground rules, which you, because we have a huge group, so please kindly follow. So um, when, uh, so this is going to be a three hour interactive session and I'm sure there will be a lot of questions coming our way through. So I would request anyone who would like to have, to ask the questions, either put it on the chat box or use virtual raise hand. So if you would like to uh, have, Put your questions up front. So I would request that because we are not holding our introduct uh, the introductions, uh, so uh, switch on your video and kindly you know introduce yourself and then ask the question. So it will us also give us a you know brief that you know what from where exactly you're coming from. In kind of any kind of technical glitch, I'm always here. So I will be putting my phone number. So kindly reach out if you are unable to log in or if there is any technical glitch that you are encountering. Uh, in terms of any questions, again, you can always reach out to me or put it in the chat with uh, chat window. And if you are unable to hear any of the panelists, again, like you know, feel free to put it in the chat window. Um, yeah, I think uh, that's about it. And yes, please, like when the panelists are presenting, kindly put yourself on mute. Um, it will be good to see all of your faces. So, if possible, kindly switch on your videos. Yes. So now over to Dr. Shlesha. Thank you, Purnima, and uh, thank you to all of you who uh, joined us on time and ahead of time as well, as I could see many people in the waiting room. So we are, I'm really excited to be hosting this panel. Uh, there was, a, you know, um, as Purnima described, I've had some training in different countries and I've worked in different uh, uh, setups. And I've also been exposed to a few different types of therapies. And this is something that has always intrigued me, you know, like, uh, there are so many different approaches and uh, many of the therapies are kind of saying the same thing, but they're also very different. How do we figure out, you know, uh, as a general clinician, perhaps what might be good, what might not be good. Um, and uh, I mean, one of the things that some of you may know, I really think it's important, especially for us in India, where there is a heterogeneity in the kind of people we see. Even amongst the same culture, we might see people with different uh, presentations. So we um, are in a unique position to uh, work more collaboratively rather than competitively, try and understand different approaches because we might have a particular style, but we may start realizing that our client may need a different approach. So I think that's the whole aim of looking at uh, different uh, ways in which borderline personality disorder can be approached. And... Um, I'm really uh, glad to have a stellar panel with me today. 
Um, we are not going to spend a lot of time in trying to talk about borderline personality disorder. There's a little bit of an assumption that you might already know about it. Uh, and I'm hoping that through the uh, presentations today, uh, you'll get a chance to uh, know a little bit more. But the focus today is really on the different therapeutic approaches and what might be the uh, some of the basic principles in each approach, what might be some of the limitations. Uh, we are also uh, try, going to try and keep the presentations in the beginning and interaction towards the end. So even if you're typing your questions in, uh, I may not let your questions come through in the beginning. Otherwise, we'll run over time. And I really want to dedicate a good amount of chunk for our uh, interactions uh, later on. So, but keep your questions coming because it's useful for us to know what's going through your mind as we are uh, doing the presentation. So without further ado, we'll get started. Uh, what we will do first is we'll, I'll invite each of the panelists to talk a little bit about their uh, therapy uh, that they are uh, you know, um, focusing on and their back, uh, background in that therapy. So I will first invite uh, Dr. Nita Thomas. And uh, Nita, while you share your slides, I'm gonna introduce you. She's a clinical psychologist in private practice with more than 10 years of experience. She did her MPhil from Nimhans uh, and she worked as an assistant professor in Department of Clinical Psychology at the Manipal College of Health Professionals and Manipal Academy of Higher Education. Uh, she was uh, the course coordinator for the first year MPhil trainees and clinical psychology consultant in the Psychosocial Rehab Center of the University. She's also guided MSc and MPhil research projects uh, throughout her time there. Her areas of interest are psychosocial rehabilitation, mental health of adolescents and young adults, acceptance and commitment therapy, dialectical behavior therapy, and uh, working with borderline personality disorder. She has undergone ex intensive training in dialectical behavior therapy from Behavior Tech. So Behavior Tech, for those of you who don't know, is the original uh, training uh, uh, organization that's run by Marshall Linehan, who founded uh, dialectical behavior therapy. So if not from the horse's mouth, we will be hearing from the what we have as the next best uh, accessible to us in India. She is currently part of a DBT case consultation team and also runs DBT skills groups. She's passionate about training mental health professionals and improving therapy experience. And thank you very much, Nita, for joining us. We'll kick off the program by you talking to us a little bit about DBT. Over to you. Thank you, Ashlesha, for that kind words. And uh, th thanks for inviting me. And I, I think Park is doing a wonderful job. Um, and it's so glad to see both Dharani and Purnima, whom I know way from way before in the panel. So that, that's really exciting to see. Uh, so uh, I think I'll take around five minutes and introduce DBT, uh, maybe five plus one minute, and then we will move to the next person, right? That's how we are going to. So right now what I'm going to give you is, it's like speed dating to DBT. So you're not going to understand what DBT is, but it's like a speed dating, like, you know, see the person who they are, uh, stuff like that, right? So, so with that, let me start. So dialectical behavior therapy, um, as most of you know, was um, uh, founded by Linehan and her colleagues in the lab. And it was started as a treatment for people with suicidal behaviors and then borderline personality disorder. And then it's used for treating a lot of other conditions in which emotional dysregulation is a fundamental problem. It's a transdiagnostic problem, so to speak. So one of the assumptions the, or the PSM theoretical models behind DBT is this biosocial model. So which means that the model assumes that people with BPD or people with emotional dysregulation has this problem because there is an underlying, usually biological, emotional vulnerability. So what we mean by this vulnerability is that these people have, people with BPD often feel, uh, are quick to have emotions. So they have more frequent emotions, emotion experiences are more intense, and they are they they take a long time to return to the baseline, right? So frequency, intensity, and slow return to baseline. So that's on one side. Along with this, there is a social aspect or an in invalidating environment, which is characterized by an environment that is very much taken aback by this intense, long-lasting, frequent emotions. Usually respond to these emotions by asking you to shut it you're weird, you're crazy, stuff like that. And 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 environment which really does not help this person, especially when they're formative years, 
to learn strategies to cope with this emotion. So the environment may overemphasize the person's capacity. This is not a big problem. You should be able to handle it. Or underemphasize the, the problem. This is, this is nothing. This is such a silly problem. Why are you getting so much upset about? The point is that everyone gets invalidated, right? All of us gets invalidated sometime or the other. The problem comes when there is repetitive, frequent invalidating experiences, which comes in way of learning self-regulation. So it is a transactional model that is really important. And this, this pattern leads to a chronic emotion regulation issue. So the person may learn over time that it's better not to have any emotion. Like any time intense emotion is there, I should do anything to shut it down. Or, or they, may, they may learn that the only way to let get people to help me is when I reach that extreme helplessness stage. So, so this, this is a very basic fundamental idea of biosocial model from which DBT is, um, which, is the, which is the baseline of DBT. So DBT takes a non-pejorative stance about clients. That means you do not blame clients for not being motivated and stuff like that. So it changes between three paradigms, behavioral paradigm, which flows in, which comes from the behavior therapy principles, acceptance and mindfulness paradigm, as well as a dialectical paradigm. So I'll just take one minute to explain what dialectics is. So dialectics includes this, this capacity to look at opposites in the same thing, to look for synthesis, to sort of encompass a systemic way of looking at things, that transactional model, different changes in one unit affects the change in another unit sort of thing, as well as this idea that impermanence is always there, change is the only thing that is constant. So when I say thesis and antithesis, I'll just quickly give, so one statement is sky is blue. An antithesis is sky is not blue. Sky has no color at all. Now, we can do we can do a few things with it. We can like look at an empirical uh, uh, experiment paradigm to see what is the color of sky, one. Or we can say that it doesn't matter. Sky can be blue and sky can have no color at all. But both of this is not dialectical. Dialectical would mean looking for truth in each perspective. What is true when we say sky is blue? What is true when we say sky has no color? So synthesis might look something like the sky appears blue to him. Sky has no color and it appears blue to human beings on the earth. Right? So that's what we mean by this. So I'll, I'll just quickly say this. DBT has multiple components, individual therapy, a group skill training, phone coaching, consultation team for therapists, which targets different functions, which we will discuss when we discuss the case. There are over 85 strategies, several protocols, 100 skills, which is organized into three paradigms. So that's why I said this is speed dating to DBT. And DPT has the central idea is to build a life worth living. It has a lot of ways it cat categorizes goals, agreements that therapists and clients make, some strategies, certain assumptions, and functions of a full treatment. So I'll come again. So I, I'll, I think I'll wind up here so that I'm not overshooting time. So these are some of the reference books that if you want to read about DPT that you can see. And there has been a wider application of DBT with children's, adolescents, school settings, forensic settings, and, and the like. I'll just take one minute to talk about therapeutic relationship. DBT looks, DBT has a dialectical perspective about therapeutic relationship. So you have certain therapeutic approaches which looks that therapeutic relationship is the therapy in itself, that it's a proxy of relationship in the past. And then there are certain approaches which looks that Therapeutic relationship is this context in which therapy is delivered. It is the setting in which therapy is delivered. That is a vehicle to change rather than cause of change. DBT thinks that both are true. So you take a dialectical perspective wherein we see that therapy is therapeutic relationship is a real relationship and it's really important and we work on that relationship. At the same time, we insist that clients need to learn skills and change the way they think and behave. So this is a dialectical stance that we take when it comes to therapeutic relationship as well. I think I'll stop here. Thank you, Nita. You know, usually when I when people talk about DBT, all we kind of hear is the different skills and the four modules. And uh, we've kind of, I think that's kind of repeated and ranted about. So your presentation, which actually tells us just 
the fundamental of what is dialectic behavior therapy. That was really refreshing to hear. Um, so for those of you who have joined us just now, we, we are not going to take any questions at the moment because what we are going to do is uh, hear from all the panelists about their different therapy approach, and then we will discuss a case. And if you have doubts coming up as, you, as we are talking, uh, you can share them on the chat window and we'll save it for interaction later. So what you just heard, or you may have just heard, uh, listened to a bit of is uh, Dr. Neeta Thomas talking about uh, her uh, uh, approach to DBT and what is the fundamental processes in dialectical behavior therapy, which is a lot of evidence for borderline personality disorder. So now, thank you, Neeta, for that. I'll move on to Dr. Aparna Ladipirla, who's going to talk to us about uh, cognitive uh, schema-focused therapy. And Aparna, while you prepare your slides, I'll uh, introduce you. So Aparna is a dear friend of mine. She has 23 years studying and working in psychiatry. Uh, she's done her diploma in psychiatry at CMC Valor after she, she moved to Australia and has completed a fellowship there. She's currently working as a psychiatrist in a community mental health team. And she also works in the intellectual disability health services in South Australia. Her interests include women's mental health, perinatal mental health, and psychotherapy. She's currently uh, training in schema-focused therapy and PIMA, which is Parental Embodied Mentalizing Assessments. She's a senior lecturer at the University of Adelaide, and her paper, Reflections on Aboriginal Perinatal Mental Health, Mothers, Babies, Families, and Community, a South Australian Experience, was published recently in uh, Australasian Psychiatry. So thank you, Aparna, for joining us uh, on the Sunday afternoon over there in Australia. And uh, uh, over to you to hear about schema-focused therapy. Brilliant. Can you hear me all right, Tash? Yes. Good. Wonderful. Thanks for that uh, very generous introduction. Um, it's mid-noon on a Sunday here in uh, Australia, and it's winter compared to all the nice warm weather that you are enjoying in India. I'll start my timer so that I usually waffle off and go uh, beyond my time. See, schema therapy is a very exciting uh, sphere for me uh, because um, as an adult psychiatrist, often your uh, I work in public mental health uh, sort of streams and uh, there is a lot of comorbidities with personality disorders in there. So you don't get to do a whole lot of therapy work, but you need those therapeutic skills. And I find that schema model um, appeals well in that regard. So in terms of the evolution of the model, it started off as being the schema model, and then it went into a more practical mode model. And I'll, I'll tell you a bit more about that as we go along. And the babushka dolls, the Russian dolls, the picture here depicts, I guess, in a way how you would see that innermost part of us as that inner child part, um, which um, goes through a lot of frustration of its needs. And how does schema in, in some ways helps to heal, um, or schema therapy helps to heal those uh, frustrated needs of the inner child. So have that model in mind. I know this is a bit of a speed dating session, so I will speed away. So the uh, historical aspects of schema therapy um, go back to America, the work uh, by psychologist Jeffrey Young. So he worked with all the CBT gurus of the day, uh, Aaron Beck, um, the likes of Woolpe. Um, and then he, he got probably stuck with um, some of the access to patients, the PD, personality disorder patients in doing CBT alone. So that's how the, the model sort of evolved. And if you look at the, the framework, it's got a little bit of CBT, bit of just all psychodynamic, a lot of attachment-based uh, framework for, for the schema therapy. The words that you would normally hear when you talk about schema therapy are these three or four terms. Um, childhood needs, um, the schemas, and we can... There's a lot of work being done on adaptive schemas. So a lot of us, when we have our needs met, we develop adaptive schemas. But when we're talking about personality disorders, we're mainly talking about maladaptive schemas. The coping styles, which is basically our survival mechanisms to cope with whatever we have uh, in terms of the frustrations. And the modes are really the practical way of uh, doing schema therapy. And like... Uh, Nita was saying earlier, it's a drip drip effect. It's not a one-off 
trauma or a big T trauma that uh, leads to a frustration of needs. It's like a repetitive frustration of the childhood needs that then makes the person view themselves and view the world in certain ways. And that forms the basis for their maladaptive schemas. So if I had a very, um, say, a very critical parent who had very high expectations of myself, I may have viewed the world as, as being um, um, very judgmental and perhaps my fear of failure then takes into a schema or I might have unrelenting standards myself. So that's how uh, a drip drip effect would lead to schemas. And like Neetha was saying, the schema model obviously as well takes into consideration the person's temperament. So a child who is more laid back temperament may view a frustrating uh, frustration of their needs a little bit different to a child who's very sensitive and who takes the same absence of the parent or the frustration of that interaction in a much more uh, difficult manner. So you've got the temperament of the child, the attachment patterns with or without trauma uh, that then lead to an impact on the child's needs. And if the child's needs are frustrated long enough, um, repetitively enough, then it develops the schemas. And we all have our own unique schemas, both our patients and ourselves, which makes it a very interesting sort of format. So it's no longer pathology sitting with the patient alone. There's pathology sitting on both ends. Um, so if you have a highly entitlement schema patient with a very subjugating therapist, then you know where things can go. So the assessment in itself uh, Parna, is... Sorry, can I just interrupt you for a second? Yeah. Is it possible to uh, play your slide or so that the slide is uh, visible on its own? Oh, okay. It's just, uh, it's not full screen, so I think people may not be able to see it. Just, just Yeah, so uh, let me yeah, play. play. Is that better? Much better, yeah, thank you. Brilliant, brilliant. So the assessment is uh, something that um, allows you to get into what are the person's schemas, what are their unmet needs, and what are the uh, modes that they are dealing with? So um, let me move into some of the unmet needs that pop up uh, in your patient's assessment. So secure attachments, these will look like the Freudian stages somehow or some of the other overlaps with other modalities. But uh, for example, if the person doesn't have realistic limits, you might end up with an entitlement schema. If the person doesn't have spontaneity and play, they might have a very rigid emotional inhibition, unrelenting standard schema. Autonomy, competence, if that is missing, they might end up with an enmeshment dependent schema and so forth. But with a lot of our BPD patients, the secure attachments, this the basic topmost need is the one that's missing. And people end up with a lot of these schemas, which look like abandonment, mistrust, abuse, emotional deprivation, defectiveness, and shame schema. Um, and secondary to that, people can then try and compensate for it by developing approval seeking or by being subjugating, et cetera. So this idea of modes, I think, is the practical way. Uh, when Jeffrey Young was working with BPD patients, there was a lot of uh, frustration with, they almost had all 18 schemas. So which schema was he going to try and solve and heal? So he realized very quickly that they flip uh, from one way to the other within sessions as well. So he came up with what is now known as the mode model in which you see the patients as having these three to four core parts. And your role as a therapist is to try and mimic the healthy adult mode. So if the biggest doll in the, in the babushka dolls is the healthy adult mode. That is what the therapist is trying to be. And in being that, you might then have to nurture the child mode. You might have to place some limits on the critic mode. You might have to place some negotiation with the coping modes, et cetera. So um, I think I will wind up there, um, Ash, if that's okay. And uh, I haven't put many references on there, but uh, I can um, add to the list as we go on. Oh, Thank good, Ash. The, yes. Thank you so much for that, Aparna. Um, I mean, I, I, 
I feel like it's really nice to, I love that idea of that babushka dolls because it is something that we end up doing maybe not so smoothly, you know, it's not like we're taking one layer and then we get to the other layer. It almost feels like sometimes the smallest layer comes up before we are ready for it and we have to kind of, you know, suddenly topple over through the other layers. But um, very nice to kind of hear the development of the schema and one of the ways of working with uh, borderline personality disorder and not just borderline personality disorder. I think that, uh, as you mentioned, it can be quite helpful in any vulnerable personality. Uh, so what you heard, guys, was, uh, you know, two uh, slightly behavioral approaches to uh, conditions which were previously thought untreatable, right? And um, as you can hear, some of this is coming from existing practices. There are theories based on... Um, which, which came from older theories, but they were adapted, adapted to suit uh, the changing presentations of our clients. And over the years, personality disorder has itself presented in so many different ways. So therapy is needed to adapt and chemo-focused therapy definitely tells us how you know, different adaptations um, can be uh, made and utilized and immersed in. And what I really like what you said, Aparna, is it's also not just the uh, client schema, it's also our own schemas and how it's important to think about a match, which really brings back to us thinking about different types of therapy and you know how uh, sometimes the therapy may be very good, the therapist may be very good, the client may be trying very hard, but the match may not be happening because you know maybe there is a clash of schemas, maybe there is it's just not the right fit. So uh, this really brings to light that you know, a match might be important. It's important to look at what's happening in the therapy room and not just what kind of therapy is being uh, used. Thank you so much for that, Aparna. Let's move on to Dr. Shivakami, who is uh, our uh, specialist in cognitive analytical therapy. Um, Dr. Shivakami Shuresh is a consultant psychiatrist and psychotherapist uh, and an accredited uh, CAT practitioner. She's completed her postgraduate training in CMC Vellore. So we have two Vellore alumni here today. And uh, uh, later she uh, trained in England as well. She's been working in Chennai since 2019 and as an independent practitioner. She also consults at Santam Health Center and Madras Center for Psychotherapy and Kanchi Kamakoti Child's Trust Hospital. She sees uh, individuals in adolescence uh, in that uh, center. She's a founder and managing trustee of the Madras Mental Health Trust. Uh, which is a two-year-old organization that wants to make clinically services uh, available for individuals and families from more socioeconomically disadvantaged backgrounds. And this trust sits alongside all other government and non-government organizations working to make comprehensive and quality mental health care available to all. Um, what I also know, I, she's not added this in her uh, uh, you know, introduction, is that a lot of uh, her CAT model, she also has adapted, I mean, she uses it in local language, it's not very much in English. So it, it translates really well to working with people who are not perhaps very uh, comfortable with English. And uh, which is why I guess this work becomes even more meaningful with the, with the trust. Uh, she runs a weekly psychotherapy skills group uh, called Balint Group for postgraduate psychiatry trainees at the Institution of Mental Health in Chennai. And uh, with the bigger aim of making more psychotherapy services available even for uh, postgraduate psychiatry trainees. So her interests include in improving psychotherapy provision, particularly for patients with complex needs and improving mental health care service delivery systems to meet the needs of local communities. Uh, thank you, Shivakami. Uh, over to you. You'll talk to us about cognitive analytical therapy. Right. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. And is my screen okay? Perfect. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Ashlesha, for that introduction. Um, so I'm going to say a bit about cognitive analytic therapy. I'm very glad to be here. It's very interesting and important for me to be part of such an event, sort of where different therapies can sit alongside one another. And like Ashlesha said, I think it's a perhaps a unique sort of program in that sense. So I'm really curious to see what's going to come up as we go along. I'll say uh, a bit about cognitive analytic therapy or CAT. Um, CAT is one among the, uh, the integrated psychotherapies. Um, it was originally developed by Dr. Anthony Ryle. 
who was a general practitioner within the national health services in the uk and uh, that way cat developed in a public healthcare system and um, cat initially developed as a response to the need for bringing different psychotherapy models together uh, so to like find a common language uh, among the different models so it's again quite interesting to sort of come together for different therapies to come together in this program as well and uh, the other need is the need for uh, something that is brief and time limited so there are many forms of therapies that are brief and time limited and um, dr aparna was talking about how where she works she finds that uh, there is already there is a clear need for not just very specialist services but also skills or approaches that can be used across different teams uh, to support individuals with different needs so in that way cat uh, also recognizes such a need and and it developed from that end and cat is used transdiagnostically across uh, different disorders including personality disorders and what i can say uh, for today's context is that in its evolution both in theory and practice the model has developed to address specific impairments at the level of personality so just to summarize what cat can be uh, it can be helpful to characterize cat as doing two therapies at once one being more cognitive problem and task focused and one being more analytic holistic and person focused so you can think of it as two levels of tasks occurring simultaneously and just to say quickly about aspects relevant to a uh, personality disorder so like all other therapies cat proposes a theory of the self and cat proposes that the self emerges within the intersubjective space and uh, real or perceived experiences in early and um later significant relationships are treated as the basis for ways of relating with one self and others uh, and already i can see an overlap with other therapies um how other therapies view personality right so cat is very much interested in that in between space so there's the adult on one end and then the infant on the other end with the infant bringing their own temperament and what cat really emphasizes on and really looks at is that the infant brings a very inherent need to relate with with the other so a, a need to seek this intersubjective uh, space within which they develop and so the infant is viewed as someone who's developing uh, a sense of themselves the world um in sort of collaboration with this other uh, person and cat is also quite interested in the wider space so the wider culture and the voices therein um and and that was quite appealing for me when i first came across cat as a trainee in the uk and when i was thinking back of india i just quickly mention about reciprocal roles because it can really help sort of understand uh, um when we use when we talk when we use cat in formulating the case so reciprocal roles is a very central concept and uh, these different experiences within relationships that we've been talking about are represented as reciprocal roles in cat so uh, there uh, a reciprocal role is uh, comprises of thought feeling action tone beliefs expectations values memory so it's a very dense concept and again i'm thinking of modes from the schema Uh, therapy um and it also includes the body so i think there's a lot of movement within psychotherapy now about including the body and how we are all probably not paying enough attention so it also includes bodily states and uh, the understanding is that uh, all of us develop a, a whole set of reciprocal roles as we grow up and it becomes repeated experiences become a sort of template uh with which we relate with ourselves and in turn with others so a set of reciprocal roles typically comprises the experience of the whole relationship and within therapy these get named identified and named using ordinary language and it can be done in any language or even using images and 
in the more integrated self a person is expected to have a broad set of roles with a degree of flexibility and connectedness between them along with the capacity to reflect on oneself however um in borderline personality disorder or uh, in more sort of moderate to severe end of the personality continuum uh someone could be left with fewer options so they could just be experiencing very negative or very harsh ways of relating with themselves or others um and they they could also be a loss of integration uh, and all, and cat is quite interested in all of this and expanding such a reflection to be able to look at oneself and grow a sense of continuity becomes one of the many tasks in therapy so just to conclude uh in cat the therapist and the client proceed to do this by creating a rather active space and in this space they can name experiences from the past as well as the present and they can proceed to recognize enactments as they happen within the session and outside sessions and there are also some direct things that can be done so in that way cat is quite a versatile and flexible sort of therapy so you could bring in very direct sort of skill based things or what we call exits and uh, these become alternate and more enabling ways to address oneself and the other so i think i'm going to stop there and uh, come back when we start looking at the case thank you thank you for that shiva kami uh, and i i really liked it that you were able to pick up on the overlaps right so that is another thing we are trying to highlight today is that it's not like everyone is going in different directions ultimately our uh, clients have experiences and the experiences will be the same whether you look at it from this side or the uh, another side but it's advantages to look at it from different lenses and include different approaches and especially with trying to use imagery and trying to use body work is really really important and more so when you're when you're limited with language when you don't you don't have the right kind of utilization of just you know english words and you need to use different approaches so i think that is uh, i think the cat model really appeals to that so thank you for that okay over to uh, mbt dharni at uh, least uh, last but not the least let me introduce dharni while she gets her slides ready so dr k dharni devi is uh, rci registered clinical psychologist and psychotherapist from uh, the green oak initiative she's got over a decade of clinical experience she completed an mphil and phd in clinical psychology from manipal university and national institute of mental health sciences uh, she also worked there in the mans as a clinical psychologist she has extensive experience working with adults with emotional and attachment difficulties her area of research during phd was borderline personality disorder and i was very fortunate to have her as my co therapist for the first mbt group that we ran and uh, i was quite sad when she had to go back to finish her phd but i'm really glad she's back with us now um and uh, so she has been uh, uh, training under uh, professor anthi bateman in mentalization based treatment and certified by the anna freud center uh she has also co-facilitated mbt groups and active part of training and supervision for mphil clinical psychology trainees during her time at nimhans she continues to provide uh, supervision for uh, uh, clinicians both individual and group supervision so over to you dharni uh, to give us an overview of mbt thank you ashlesha um and thank you so much for asking me to speak on mentalization based treatment so this is something that i really like and uh, relate to a lot and uh, like everybody has now noticed and dr shikami has also noticed previously i find that there's a lot of overlap uh in the way things are understood your understanding the uh way it is you know how you work with it but especially the conceptualizing okay. So let me just start with saying what is mentalizing. Now we all mentalize; it's an imagine, imaginative activity. It's how we understand and make sense of behavior, actually, and understand that they're related to all our thoughts, beliefs, uh, desires, right? So it involves thinking both about our, our own functioning and also understanding how somebody else may be functioning. And it kind of gives us this autobiographical continuity. That's a sense of coherence over a timeline. so i can understand that this is how i was it helps us reflect this was how i was a child as an adolescent as an adult it this process of having that continuity and not knowing hey you know what i was like this as a child and suddenly 
I don't know what happened. I'm a different adult. So that lack of uh, coherence is a sign of non-mentalizing. So when we talk about mentalizing, we also need to know what non-mentalizing looks like. When you talk about lots of details and there's no aspects of feelings, concrete, sometimes you can hear clients say, you know what, I just know how this is. I mean, I'm so sure this is how someone else, you know, this is what they're thinking in their minds. So this kind of thing. So themselves saying, you know, I'm lazy. I know it. I know I'm very lazy and I'm very manipulative. You've heard clients use these terms, especially borderline clients. These are all signs of non-mentalizing. Just to understand, while the concept of mentalization is not very new, the mentalization-based treatment was developed by Professor Peter Fonagy and Professor Anthony Wakeman. It has its roots in attachment theory, which is kind of what I noticed most of us speaking today has spoken about transactional nature, the interaction in early childhood. So having a secure, consistent caregiver who's responding to the child's signals helps the child make sense of themselves, their needs, and also how the world is going to react to them. So that develops into the internal working model. It also provides a sense of security to the child. So it buffers you from traumatic experiences to know that you have someone to share it with. But what actually happens is when there's a disruption in the attachment, especially when there's a maltreatment or trauma, in the normal course, when you're upset, when there's fear, your attachment system is activated, you seek proximity, and the caregiver helps you downregulate the emotions. So then when this happens repeatedly, there's a bond that's developed, you develop epistemic trust. Now, what epistemic trust is, it's the ability to trust the source of information that you're getting. But what happens when there's maltreatment is that there is no downregulation of emotions. In fact, you are faced with further adverse emotional experiences as the trauma is caused by the attachment figure of whom you're seeking proximity to. So this further increases your distress and the cycle keeps going on. When this is repeated, and I think this is something that um, Nita was talking about initially with DBT, when this happens repeatedly, it affects your ability to mentalize. That is, it affects your ability to make sense of yourself as well as others, to um, understand and strike a balance between um, you know, what is how much to how close could you be or how away you need to be in relationships. Now, what we talk about and uh, in BPD is that there are so much of these attachment disruptions, maltreatment, neglect that happens within the attachment figure itself, which leads to difficulties in mentalizing and affect regulation. And so, and also have difficulties in understanding self and others. So you can see how the BPD symptoms of problems with identity happens, problems with emotional regulation happens, impulsivity, a lot of interpersonal conflicts. So mentalization-based treatment has this process where we start with an assessment, giving them the diagnosis, you formulate, you understand the attachment patterns and the types of mentalizing that's used by the individual, assess for risk, develop a crisis plan, contract, and also discuss what would be the potential barriers to treatment. And then you go into an MBTI, which is an introductory psychoeducation. And finally, then you have the MBT, which is individual, and you're also assigned to a group, ideally. And then, of course, there's supervision through all of this. What MBT looks like in one session is just this, that you start talking about an event, um, how you felt at the time, then you look back on it, um, then you talk about the current feelings you have when you're talking about this in therapy what it's like, and then think about an alternate perspective. The whole aim of MBT is to promote mentalizing and to make it more robust. Some of the things that you end up doing is using a not knowing stance, being very curious and being patient with the client, not giving them a solution, but asking them to, hey, let's understand this together. You talk about the here and now, a lot of empathic validation is used. You not only track the client's mental states in the session, but also the therapists and sometimes a bit of disclosure of how the therapist is thinking or what the therapist is feeling about uh, or in that particular session is helpful and is used to encourage relational mentalizing. Concluding, mentalization is not a new concept. It's very effective in treating BPD, ASPD, and right now there's evidence for eating disorders, trauma, and depression too. It's very useful in working with family and adolescents, and it does not require extensive additional training. 
So I am concluding with that. Thank you very much, Dharvi. Uh, uh, I'm a little bit biased towards MBT uh, because I practice MBT as well, but I really um, could see that, you know, there is a lot of similarity and I'm glad you mentioned attachment because uh, that's a fundamental thing that all of us are talking about, right? The early years of a child, how that can, uh, like uh, Nita talked about invalidating environment and, uh, you know, different schemas that can develop, but also like what you talked about, how, uh, you know, if the attachment caregiver itself ends up causing uh, distress, how the seeking proximity seeking can itself become traumatic for the infant and how that can lead to non mentalizing. Um, so just listening to all of you, one of the things that I'm hoping that our uh, audience can pick up is we've heard these different types of therapy. And of course, we're talking about borderline personality disorder. But it, it occurs to me that these therapies can also be useful. And there is evidence, as we heard, in applying in different settings as well. So, um, I, I, you know, just in terms of for, for the sake of today's webinar, we are going to stick to borderline personality disorder. But what may be helpful for uh, all of you to think about what kind of clients you're working with. Some of you may not be working with borderline personality disorder. Some of you may be working with just traits. Maybe some of you may be working with history of trauma, but not necessarily translated into like a full-fledged personality disorder. So it might be helpful to think about these approaches. How does it, you know, which bit would work well for you? Another crucial thing, of course, is not just the therapist's own uh, schema or personal history, but therapist personality also. We all have a certain kind of personality. You know, some of us uh, prefer being directive, prefer uh, sort of having a very structured model. Some of us, sorry, my cat is interrupting me. Uh, some of us may want to be a little bit more laid back and uh, allow a more exploratory kind of uh, approach. So while we are looking at all these different approaches, we're not just saying that, you know, this is the approach you should try because it sounds great. I think it's also important to think, okay, what, what, what am I going to be comfortable as a therapist applying? What is my style? You know, what might be uh, uh, interest, like useful for me to apply? And I've certainly seen that happen to me. I worked in a team with DBT and I really like some of the principles, but I'm not a very uh, a behavioral person. So I felt like, you know, even though it was making sense to me, I wasn't being genuine enough to that. Uh, to that model. So I feel like it's important to recognize what you are as a person as well and what your style might be. And sometimes it may be immersing yourself in one particular form, learning the skills, and then um, saying, okay, this is useful for me. I might take away something from here, but it's not my style. I might try something else. And that's okay too. And it's important to pick up different styles and see what's helpful. Uh, some of my trainees and my uh, teammates who are here like to also use eclectic approach, don't like to be bogged down with just one approach. And that's good as well. And um, but, uh, but ultimately, what we're looking for is what is helpful for the person sitting in front of us. And it's not it's not sort of important to say, I am this therapist, so I'm only going to do this. But what does this person need? So let's come to this, the person that we're going to talk about. Um, I will share my screen and just sort of, you know, because we are talking about borderline personality disorder, uh, what are we really looking at generally when we look at borderline personality disorder? And you may have seen this, you know, there is, and as you heard, it, just in the, the fundamentals of the therapies and where they stem from, they are trying to address a lot of these things, you know, so people with personality disorder and especially borderline personality disorder have disturbances in different aspects of their uh, personality and life. One of the key things that comes up is, of course, disturbed relatedness. So they have unstable relationships. They have a, a poor sense of self. So their identity is disturbed. And then that makes it difficult for them to relate to others. They have chronic feeling of emptiness. So they might quickly attach to something because they feel like, okay, this is going to be my new identity. I'm going to be this person. Or they might quickly attach to someone thinking that, you know, that is how I'm going to be. I'm going to be this person who that guy or that girl likes. And when it becomes very stressful, when they can't get in a sense of themselves, they might also start doubting themselves, doubting others. And you might see them presenting with paranoid ideas. 
Now, while they're navigating this internal model, they also cannot just smoothly sail through life. So what they struggle with is dysregulations in their emotions. And that can be, you know, they can suddenly be okay with something very small, can make them very happy. Something very small can also distress them very quickly. They might, uh, I, I don't like it that it says inappropriate anger, because that is the one thing we often tell our uh, clients that whatever emotions you have are appropriate. It's the intensity that might not be matching. Right. So they might have anger, which is justified, but the intensity to which it gets to or the way the outburst happens, that may be inappropriate. And there may be instability in their affects. And a lot of the times they're really fearful of being left alone to their empty self. So there is an affective dysregulation. And one of the most common uh, reasons for referral to therapy or to clinicians is their behavioral dysregulation, the impulsive behavior. Uh, you know, suicidality, self-harming, aggression, uh, maybe, uh, you know, substance use, all of that impulsive behavior is what ends up in uh, coming to therapy, but really what gets addressed or needs to be addressed after the initial uh, stability is, is those underlying uh, disturbances. So what I'm going to do now is sh sharing, I'm going to share a case vignette. And, and I'll read it out, but what I will also do is just see if I can share it with you on the chat screen so that you all have access to it. If I can just figure out. Uh, meanwhile, if anyone has any questions, you can uh, post it here. Oh, there's a file. So Just uh, tell me if you can access the case vignette. I posted it on the chat and I will um, read it out as well so that you have um, an idea. And what we'll do is we'll ask each of the panelists to think about this case and uh, see how they would approach it from their particular uh, therapies, therapeutic stance. Um, I'll do share screen again. So I have anonymized this uh, person's personal details. Uh, so it might be a little uh, vague in some areas. I haven't given uh, too many close details. Uh, Miss BS is a uh, sorry, I can't. See. She's a 21 year old student. She was referred to, uh, when she was first referred, she was referred, that, that was her initial contact to a psychiatrist. Uh, at that time, she was a student in a college and she was referred by the college counselor. The main reason for referral was she was missing classes, frequently getting upset with friends. And every time an exam would be coming up, she would be quite anxious and stressed. And she would start voicing suicidal ideas. Uh, so when she was going through the psychiatric assessment, the uh, history, of uh, self-harm, uh, self-harming behavior was uh, revealed, which had been going on for three years, uh, just around the time of her, uh, you know, entry into college and uh, getting into this kind of degree. So that that time is when the self-harming uh, started, and mostly as she described as a coping mechanism. But she also had two previous suicide attempts where she tried taking an overdose. Uh, one was in the context of a relationship breakup, and the other was when a close friendship broke up. And at the time of the referral, she was not in a relationship, but she was complaining of feeling very lonely and left out and wanted to find the right guy soon before she lost, lost the opportunity, you know, before all the guys were taken. Uh, she gave a history of growing up in a metro city with her parents and older brother. He was four years older than her and was pursuing her postgraduate studies overseas at the time of this referral. Uh, she said her mom is a professor and described by her as a very strict person, but caring. Uh, she said mom would run the house like clockwork and expect everyone to do everything on time and by the book because she was a working professional. She felt like everything, if everyone did what they had to do, then everything would go smoothly. Otherwise, it will all fall on her. So she was kind of, you know, caring in the way that I can only provide these things for you if you do your end of the bargain. Um, dad ran his own business and was described again as short tempered, especially when he got worried about finances or how is he going to be able to provide for the kids or are the kids safe? Have they come back from school? 
you know so if he gets worried then it turns into a temper and this was something that was identified by the family even before a therapist told them that uh but he left most of the parenting and housework to his wife uh but for him the if, if the kids got upset or distressed that he would be like what's going on so they learned very quickly very early on that they they shouldn't get upset in front of him they can't cry in front of him um their marriage was generally stable with not many conflicts that they could see so this is how she she thought it was okay uh but over the last few years as she was a little older she could, she noticed there was financial stress you know especially when she would to ask for fees and things like that uh and he had gone through losses in his business she had also noticed more fights in the parents but there was no physical abuse or violence that was witnessed by the children she felt she could she never really felt comfortable sharing any of her problems with her uh, parents and uh, she felt that mom and and this was more in exploration you know i i don't know if this is your experience but when when first time i see someone if you ask them oh how was your childhood the kind of response would be yeah it was fine no, nothing my mom and dad used to work and we used to get everything and we were fine and then you start exploring you know who was your go to person who would you go to if you're upset and then you start realizing that they may or may not have had that so for her it was like i don't know i never really had anything to talk to about with anyone uh what would happen if you went to mom and said you know my friend uh, fought with me today or teacher shouted at me I said no i could never tell mom because then she'll just blame me oh why what did you do why did the teacher shout at you so she felt she couldn't go to mom because mom would try and see what was wrong and dad would get even more upset okay okay you don't cry now do don't get upset about these things so even though they were generally caring nurturing parents there was some lacking in space of emotional uh, vulnerability they didn't feel at least she didn't feel that she could share her problems and uh, when they would fight what she remembered is she would get scared she was like because they didn't quite know what was going on rightfully the parents had protected them from the deeper problems if there were any but for her it was like oh did i do something wrong why are they fighting what's happening uh there's no history of sexual abuse or any other overt trauma in her history her first relationship was during high school she said she always used to play hard to get but then would lose the guy because uh, she would have a crush on someone she would play hard to get and then he would lose interest and go off finally she dated someone she didn't like for a, uh, about 6 7 months she thought that you know he's getting a better deal she's not that interested in him and uh, but when they broke up she was really heartbroken and went through her first what sounded like a depressive episode and uh, during college she started dating an older guy uh, for which she fought so her best friend fought with her and said you can't do that what's wrong with you and that friendship it broke off and that's when uh, she took her overdose and was referred to the college counselor she didn't really engage well in therapy would often be late or miss sessions and by now she also had changed a few psychiatrists and wasn't seen to see a, keen to see another one but it was more like it came from college unless you see a psychiatrist and get on a plan and crisis crisis management you won't uh, you know we can't support you because her dysregulation would be very uh, evident in college uh so how she would present in therapy sessions she would often be very verbose give lots of details uh for fear of not being understood she would struggle to talk about her emotions uh and will not be able to say was it what did she feel scared did she feel anxious did she feel angry um she also if she was asked about her emotions if she would ask well, what do you think is going on she would get disconnected would withdraw because she wasn't sure if whatever she said was going to be judged she was going to be judged by the therapist she would also get easily upset if she perceived the clinician was looking bored or upset or looking at the watch and uh, very quickly would feel like okay they are not the right person for me and would not want to go back okay so this is a generic kind of case that i'm uh, giving to the clinicians what they can also do is they might add some um, uh, examples from their own clinical experience i might start with you shivakami are you okay to go first and uh, uh, then we'll um, go to dharani and then uh, aparna and then neeta okay so shivakami do you want to give us a uh, do you want me to leave this case on the screen or do you, will you be sharing your slides Yes, I happen to have a couple of slides. Yeah, so I'll st stop sharing. That's why I've, I've shared the case vignette with everyone. If you want to uh, uh, look at it while uh, we are talking about different therapies.
Shall I start, Ashlesha? Yes, yeah. you can start. Uh, so I'm sure by now, uh, everyone is beginning to think about this person. And I'm going to spend some time uh, trying to think about how we might um, try to understand this person using a CAT framework. Um, so one thing I thought I can say before we get into that is that within CAT, um, formulation um, is an activity that is done ex uh, along with the client. Uh, and this is something very, I think it's one of the very, um, something very core to CAT, something about uh, thinking with the uh, client or patient, uh, even as we try to make sense of their problems. And um, this usually happens in the first four to six sessions, which is typically the initial stage in therapy and it gets called the reformulation stage. And I think the reformulation is something about how any person, whether they come to therapy or not, they're going to have their own understanding of their own problems. And therapy is viewed as an activity that extends that. Um, so, to, to, so it really invites that person's, what they already think or what they already understand in that sense. And what I'm going to try and do is to pick up themes that seem significant and, uh, and, and can help in making sense of this person's current difficulties. And the other thing I thought I can say is that in CAT, uh, this whole activity is also a very tentative one in that the idea is to have an understanding that is shared. So um, it might be helpful if I say that what I mean by that is that the understanding that is developed remains open to revision throughout the process of therapy. So it's not a very final um, sort of conclusion or anything like that, that is presented to the client or held by the team or the therapist. It's more like a, an evolving, very dynamic thing, which is open to revision and um, open to development. And the other thing is that the formulation can be represented visually as a map. And this is something that's also, um, um, that ha that, that's a very routine uh, sort of activity in CAT. And it seems to have specific, uh, it seems to support working with individuals with specific difficulties like this person, for example, and maybe we'll get to see that uh, as, as we go along. So, I thought I will sort of use this map to speak with you all about how I started thinking about her. And um, so when I was reading this case vignette, I was trying to listen and look for sort of what it must have been like for her growing up in this particular family environment. And that is what we would do in CAT in the first few sessions. And I was looking for dominant experiences and I started putting, the, putting them down using words. So these are typically just ordinary words that would come up in conversation, you know, within the session. And we're looking for repeated themes. And I think this is something that came up even when others were talking about, you know, even in uh, different therapies, something that happens again and again is possibly much more significant than a one-off event. And uh, these words came to my mind. Something central was something about control. So we would start naming um, those experiences as say, you know, parents bringing in possibly a high level of control. So when I was listening about dad's anger, there seemed to be a lot of power in that. And, uh, and, and mother's need for things to probably be at a certain standard. So perhaps a very high standard and how the young person or the child is naturally drawn to a position in the bottom. So the roles are typically the parent in the top and the child in the bottom. And this can change later in life. Anybody can occupy any role. So something about being very, feeling very controlled. And I was reminded of the proverb, you know, how children are to be seen and not heard, which is something that used to be how people look at children, I suppose. And so that was one theme that came up. And um, the other, you know, very core thing seems to be about 
being left to herself and uh, that immediately in a way relates with the you know at a, the presenting difficulty of uh, experiencing very um painful loneliness and uh, something about you know overlooking overlooked and or being left being neglected and um, that was the other uh, set of roles that came up and so this seems to you know the the important thing that seems to emerge is the lack of space to express herself in some way in in any way and every family is going to do this differently but in some way and this seemed like a big absence and seemed to connect with uh, how uh, she might be uh, dealing with herself later in life um, and the other one seemed to be blame and the, the the part in the vignette where they talk about the struggles in the parents marriage and she being an onlooker like a witness possibly being very confused and tending to blame herself so a lot of guilt um there and um and it appears as if she has coped mostly by working very hard in the sense working hard to keep things under control and uh, we would start looking that looking at that as a as a coping state so something about on the side where as if she's trying her best to go to this ideal sort of state where mother is happy there are you no know, she is not the cause for any disturbance so that takes us to maybe the top place where typically we try to capture the more sort of wished for place or the desired place which is usually almost very magical it's as if like imagining a house where the child will never cry or imagining a, a relationship with a partner who will understand uh the other person perfectly get their feeling you know uh, understand their feelings very you know in a very um be very connected and those things are they usually take on a very magical quality and possibly something that is unattainable but become like a wish or something that the person starts seeking and in her case it feels like slowly um for her as a child it was mostly to keep things quiet and stay in the approved place but gradually perhaps um a longing to be accepted or cared for and sort of seeking that kind of closeness affection intimacy but more importantly without being able to risk any connection emotionally so i was i was reading about the hard to get part and i was thinking how it's as if you know where she cannot risk and that maybe brings us back to the overlooked place where she is kind of perhaps overlooking herself and maybe the the pressure to be you know to receive care is so much that she's in a way overlooking what she likes so there was that example where she was in a relationship where she didn't even like the other person or another example where she entered a relationship where she lost a very valued friendship so it you know um in a way the overlooking part seems to be very powerful and and also manifesting in her relationships with the therapist or the doctors and that i think came out nicely in how in the description about what happens in a therapy session or in an interaction where she is very verbose very um you know i was using the words cut off or like a soldier like who's just kind of working working hard to maybe do well in therapy and um, but cannot somehow just pause or look at okay what's going on for me right now or what's going on here so so that's how i started um identifying different roles that seem to be recurrent in and and how this young this this young person might have managed that within their family environment and how that's getting played out in different situations in their life subsequently and um, i think what would uh, the other things i would be very curious about is what are they actually looking for in a close relationship or um, what do they what seems like what what do they need that sort of thing and i also think um uh, there's also the part about how so much of maybe overlooking inevitably leads to losing control so in cat 
I've not drawn that here, but in CAT, we would draw that as a dilemma where it's as if the only two options that uh, are available to deal with feelings is either to cut off or explode. So the exploding could be where it might be happening in a setting like college or where the instance when she took the overdose where that's and, and it, where it's no longer possible to remain cut off. And um, so the goal in therapy would possibly be to be more curious about one's own feelings. I think we will start at that level. And you would, you can, what it would look like in CAT is we wouldn't have this map to begin with. So this is something I came up with from, you know, in, in my own mind, these were the words that uh, I chose. But in CAT, we would be sitting side by side with that person. So already, even in the telling of the story, we are trying to um, uh, relate in a way where we are curious, we are interested in what it was like, what it felt like. And naming these, identifying and naming these roles can be quite powerful in you know, getting attention to all this, things that have probably been overlooked for a very long time. And um, so that would become the goal in therapy and uh, perhaps to start such curiosity or such interest with respect within the session and then slowly find ways to extend that outside sessions. And we can, yeah. Um, and on the map, there's also that, uh, the, the drawing of the eye. So that's called the observing eye. So that typically represents that idea of being able to reflect on oneself. And I think this, is, this sort of supports work with, you know, it could support work with this person, for example, where that lack of reflection becomes one of the core things that need to be addressed, which can then help her actually manage other um, actions like hurting herself or, um, so the, the, the eye is something that is expected to develop over time. Um, I think that's all I have to say actually. Um, I've, yeah, so I'm just going to stop there. Thank you for that Shivakami. Uh, I think what you uh, rightly said, what you kind of described is this is, although you've come up with this on your own for the purpose of this case, what you would be doing in therapy is just going through this process with them. And that it sounds like just doing the process with them itself can be quite therapeutic, right? Just sitting down and recognizing there's control, recognizing there might be blame, you know, recognizing that and helping them explore that itself can be quite therapeutic. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, so yes, Nehal's put a comment saying the eye also brings in a systemic lens. So it looks like, is it the eye like looking from the outside into this, uh, into this kind of, uh, what's happening for this person? Yeah, um, absolutely. That's a very, uh, thoughtful comment. So it's literally about sort of stepping out and being able to look at it. And, um, I was also thinking how for just think staying with this person, somebody who's quite cut off, uh, I think it'd be really important to do this very slowly. Mm. Um, and because it can, this can be done very easily, like very quickly. And the point is can get lost. So yeah. I think the I is probably the main thing in the sense, something about stepping out and looking at it. And I think the map itself also becomes like a third space, like between where you can place things even physically, like it's usually a paper or in online sessions, it can be a PowerPoint slide. So where you, you kind of put things that, that are unbearable or that can't be talked about ever, or that can't be looked at, but this sort of becomes like a holder and people interact with the map in their own way. So it's quite interesting. People can have a relationship, like a whole, obviously a whole relationship with the map, like, and sometimes, People may never look at it or sometimes people say, I'm going to frame this. So stuff like that, but that's a very thoughtful comment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'll just quickly say, if I have a minute, yes, I think yes. um, what I've not said so far in my first presentation and here is more about what the therapist is required to do uh, in the sense that in, I think in this form, while formulating, um, especially the part where, the, the 
looking at the therapeutic relationship i think like in mbt again cat requires the therapist to be very active in the sense to have a way to reflect on themselves especially within the session and sometimes even outside i mean even outside sessions so to see how what's going on for them in relation to this person and uh, many times that may be where you're naming things so somebody may never want to talk about their past or they don't want to talk about anything actually so it might be that all you have is just what's going on with you and that person so that's that's also a great place to start where you can start by hey it feels like i'm doing all the talking or it feels like we're talking so much but as if we're not really be missing something important something like that so then it it gives a starting point and the therapy space can be where we are naming these roles and then that can allow somebody to talk about something that is very painful for them it's like giving almost like so the therapist is expected to be very active be ready to um hold difficult feelings use them that sort of thing so that's just something i wanted to add that's all thank you so much for coming um i know this feels like we are on a conveyor belt and just moving but i will move to the next uh, approach so it's useful just think about these things as you're listening this is one way of looking at it now the same person how they might uh, look at uh, you know we looked at through another lens so dharni if you want to uh, guide us through the mbt approach for this client um as you're getting ready i also realize that this can be an experience that a therapist might end up, i mean a client might end up having right they might go to a therapist they might do a bit of work and then they go to another one who has a different approach and how if you're not mindful of where they've come from or you know how it might be quite like jerking okay what's going on now now we're doing something different so it's 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 quite useful to remember that they might have come from a particular approach and now over to mbt thank you there thanks ashlesha so while i was listening to dr shivkami talk about uh, how she was looking at this client i also realized there's a lot of um, aspect that i use in the mentalization formulation so while i'm talking about this is a very simple format to understand the formulation um you get the current themes the vulnerability factors assessment of risk and you develop a crisis plan you also talk about protective resilience factors talk about the patterns of mentalizing attachment and their relationship patterns and you make treatment predictions um like dr shivakami said this is a very collaborative process you do an initial assessment specifically to develop the formulation and that is about a session two or three sessions long at least and with this client especially it may take longer because there is a fear of intimacy you jump in too quickly this person is going to uh, step back equally fast so we'd have to take in at uh, all of those aspects but before we go into the mbt formulation uh, there is a small uh, there are a couple of things that i haven't um, spoken about in terms of the i'm sorry why is this is this being no we can hear you then no i'm just thinking my uh, slides on changing and i'm wondering why Okay, one second. Can you just click enter? Maybe that works. Okay. So basically, I want to talk about is the dimensions of mentalizing. This is because part of mentalizing we talk about automatic and controlled. These are things. Automatic is things where you're not spending too much time. It's very quick, um, and you make judgments. All of us engage in all of these, by the way. Controlled is when you are pausing, taking time, and trying to understand. Okay, what happened here? so that's controlled we have internally focused and externally focused in another dimension internally focused is when you're looking at what are my feelings what is going on what are thoughts and not just for yourself but also for the other person what might be the person's intentions what may be their values it's internally focused and externally focused would be all facial expressions body language um how they appear what they do seems to be the cognitive are your thoughts and affective is when you're highly focused on emotions you can be self focused or other focused wherein when you're talking about self focused you're talking about yourself and the other focus so you people move from one pole to another and 
you the thing with borderline personality is they get stuck in one of these poles and that's how we understand that they have their mentalizing has gone offline the other part of the assessment of mentalizing is these non mentalizing modes that we call now psychic equivalence is something where the person uh, is very concrete feels what they're thinking is the reality so i am a horrible individual and that's the truth people are going to not like me because i am horrible it's a it's held with a lot of conviction right uh, they don't have space for alternative perspectives here the teleological stance this is where actions are given more importance which you see in borderlines right the gestures carry more meaning uh, someone who only if you buy me a bouquet of flowers do you love me and for them also only if i do something very physical will my emotional state change say for example the self harm if i cut myself i will feel better so these are teleological stances the pretend mode where often there is no connection between what they are thinking and what is happening outside it's like they are locked in a bubble of their own so there is this uh, sense of they they are talking very intellectually but it is affectively empty and you feel like okay do am i even required the therapist often feels like you really don't need me to have this monologue i could you might be as well talking to a wall sometimes i mean you've had that feeling with these clients so dissociation is an extreme form of it and it leaves a person feeling very empty and not understood so these are some of the things we need to identify when we are speaking to the individual so for this client what i would say is and for the formulation the reason i've written it down is uh, it's a very conversational formulation so it's not like so and so so bs is so uh, you know 21 year old woman with with not like that it's something that you're doing conversationally so you say what are our current aims as we were talking over the last few sessions i noticed that you want you're feeling very lonely and what you'd like to work on is connecting with people making more meaningful relationships um you also mentioned the need to manage your emotions better under stress but what we notice here is that while you were growing up you had a absent father and a strict and controlling mother as a result you did not have space to understand regulate or express your emotions and the emotional expressions that you did see in your family often terrified you currently your brothers move a few years back as well as the loss of important relationships such as your best friend and subsequently your boyfriend may have triggered a sense of loneliness in you and this still makes you vulnerable to what you're going through right now how despite your anxieties you're currently with associated with exams you are currently pursuing your education and your i'm here i've assumed here that her relationship with her brother may be a source of support but i would explore for more there we also talk about risk factors you tend to find interpersonal conflicts extremely overwhelming and tend to use self harm to manage your emotions so we have to develop a crisis plan separately to help you in such situations so this crisis plan will have uh, details of emergency contact whether you're offering in between session phone assistance um you identify you know uh, the different levels of crisis and how how do you do at you know when is crisis getting escalated how do you handle this how much help would you receive all of this is in the crisis plan which is separate by the way and that's an entire session by itself the mentalizing profile which is where we identify and how i convey it it be you appear to have difficulty understanding what is sorry not doing going through your own mind as well as what's happening in the minds of others you then make quick non reflective judgments based on observable features such as the body language facial expressions you also focus more on others and tend to neglect your own internal world you are quite sensitive to emotional cues and become very overwhelmed by them you can also use examples if the person has spoken about it say if there's a relationship here you could say that um you know your relationship with your friend how that broke down say uh when you thought she was not supportive of your decision to date an older guy you felt she never understood you uh her lack of support or lack of interest in her face or her anger meant she rejecting she's rejecting you and hence uh you felt abandoned and lonely so that kind of a thing during times of stress you tend to slip into very concrete thinking and it becomes difficult to entertain possible alternate perspectives one of the ways uh, of coping is to go into a very analytical mode but this makes it hard for you to face emotions which is what she was doing in the therapy sessions wherein she would talk a lot but 
it doesn't have a lot of content and there's a kind of stepping away from her emotions that she's doing as a coping you also tend to act quickly or engage in behaviors to alter your mental states moving on to attachment and relationship patterns we you've been struggling with your interpersonal relationships you find it hard to balance closeness and distance you're wary of connecting with others and your relationships appear superficial there's also a tendency for you to be dismissive about your relationships which is you know which is a way in which you protect yourself from being hurt so acknowledging that it's been a co coping way for her that she's been hurt in the past her way is to distance herself um however when they do not work out you are left feeling abandoned and alone you also have a feeling that you're not being understood by other people how this would affect therapy is also something that you discuss and contract what this may mean for us is that you may be hyper vigilant in therapy and look out for signs of rejection perceived rejection sorry you may also be wary of this relationship and may be afraid of being judged by me as therapy advances you may become uncomfortable with the developing intimacy and may try to pull away either by missing sessions or dropping out completely and yeah so uh, this is something that um, one second yeah so this is something that i would uh, share with the client take the feedback in the session as to how much they agree with this and this is something that the client takes back with them so that at different points in the therapy we will uh, go back to these you know if there is a rupture which is highly possible with this client um i would we would say you know remember we discussed about how this may be a problem that we will face in therapy what do you think about it so this is a way of bringing back the mentalizing uh for this client like dr sivakami said one of the things we will be doing is approaching it very slow um initial part would be just to develop awareness of mentalized emotions she experiences emotions but does not know how they feel in her so maybe working on that helping her develop an affect focus in the session a lot of empathic validation um and curiosity with her state how does this feel how are you feeling in you which part of your body are you feeling this can you describe it to me so that the person develops the knowledge of the affect first and then uh we can step into the next steps of mentalizing uh, risk is another thing that would have to be kept in mind because um every interpersonal co uh, context she's going to be in can be potential risk factors for us and she has engaged in self harm in the past so stabilizing that um and also i think working on her initially trying to reduce the anxiety associated with exams might also because that's also a part of stabilizing her environment so she can mentalize better but in the session the focus will be she brings in a narrative of something that happened in the week and we explore it um with this client a lot of maybe here and now work would be most suggested what's happening in the session how are you feeling when i say this slowly bringing in the concept that um she may be making assumptions about the therapist and the therapist some amount of self disclosure there say so that's not i mean not in the sense that you don't say you don't reject you don't say um uh, that's not what i was thinking oh that's interesting how you thought um this is what i was thinking and i wonder how you came to it though my intentions were slightly different now let's understand how the discrepancy happened so that's a way in which we would discuss how the person came to the conclusion and how it may be different from what the therapist was thinking yeah so it's a and i know the mbt is the, again time limited so we have around 18 to 24 months of individual therapy so there is a termination stage at some point but a lot of the work will be in terms of um initially engagement stabilization but followed by improving mentalizing um we will tackle the different the pretend mode when it happens the teleological mode when it happens uh psychic equivalence so these are terms but when you notice that's happening in the therapy session we pause and we bring back a period when the person was reflecting the idea is emotional arousal uh, is also tackled because we feel like when emotional arousal is high mentalizing is definitely not on cards it goes offline for all of us so the idea is to keep the balance of emotional regulation and arousal optimum if it's too less the person is dissociated again not engaging so you have to watch the temperature in the room emotional temperature in the room all the time i think i think that's about it 
Yeah. Thank you for that, Dharni. Uh, I think, uh, you know, just in terms of how you highlighted the formulation as a conversational formulation where you're sharing with the client your understanding of and, and exploring it together. That was quite helpful. And again, it looks like similar to what uh, I felt with Shivakami in terms of just that process of shared understanding itself is a good starting point. Because often the experience from what I've heard from clients is they get told they either have a diagnosis or they don't have a diagnosis. And we are now really talking about the therapies, trying to understand this person, not just as someone with a label or without a label, but as a combination and compilation of difficulties that have arisen. Uh, so thank you for that. I'm just wondering if we could, we should take a small break right now before we move into the next uh, half of the morning. Um, it's uh, 11.33 for me. So shall we come back in about 10 minutes? And then, so just uh, in 10 minutes would be good because then we can get to the next uh, two presentations and then we'll, we'll talk a little bit about limitations of therapy as well after that. Okay. Thank you, everyone. See you in 10 minutes. Here are some of the thoughts already. So I'll piggyback on uh, some of the attachment-based conversations that people have, uh, the speakers before me have already formulated. So we're looking at formulating these experience through a schema therapy approach. And if you remember the earlier slide I um, shared with you, there's um, some of these schemas develop because of the frustrated needs. And uh, like I said, some of the speakers really highlighted, highlighted how her needs were frustrated. For example, she didn't have a parent to go to to express her emotions. Her father was too angry with her or with both of the siblings for expressing their emotions. So there is an um, untold um, sort of dictum there that emotions are too much uh, or don't show your emotions uh, or you're too needy. Um, you, you've got two, two uh, big emotions and all of those kinds of things, which the person can internalize and make a narrative of my emotions are bad or I am bad. And we can see how that will then lead to the, the critic part of them or the critic mode. So the first step is basically trying to understand what are these schemas and what are her unmet core needs. Uh, and like people have eloquently described, it's a collaborative approach. So you're, you're like making a tapestry with the patient um, in terms of walking through their history, but through a new lens. And this time the lens is through how these needs are universal. Often the schema, as a schema therapist, you'd be saying things like, you know, um, a child needs unconditional positive regard. Every child needs that. Um, you deserve uh, to be seen as your own person. Every child deserves that. So you kind of make a universal stand um, in, in being that voice for the child and for the child's needs. So you can see that her childhood needs that have been frustrated are her freedom to express, her sense of security around emotional vocabulary, and also her sense of competence. I mean, she's got a high-functioning mother, a relatively non-available father, things have to go according to the clock, the slightest frustration, then um, she feels like a failure. So um, it's a drip, drip effect. It's not a one-off trauma that we're talking about. It's an everyday frustration. And lo and behold, the child part of her, which holds the feelings and the schemas, is internalizing message of, I'm a failure. I've got too many emotions expressing my emotions is bad. There's nobody around to hold me or hold my emotions together. And this can lead to certain schemas of failure, unrelenting standard, abandonment, emotional deprivation, and subjugation. Subjugation is basically my needs don't matter. You know, I, I am not meant to express them for whatever reasons. Um, Going into uh, the mode model, like I said, um, Jeffrey Young initially started with the schema model, so he would explore the schemas and try and address them. But very soon he found that in BPD patients, there are too many schemas. So following each schema became almost impossible. So the mode model encompasses all those schemas into the child part. So if you look at B, B was feeling quite left out 
Uh, and at this point, she's almost looking for that fantasy escape of this right guy coming soon. And she's very stressed about her exams, her level of, I guess, performance and this sense of judgment and fe uh, failure around it. So the child mode, as you can see, the smallest doll perhaps within those Babushka dolls is the one that holds all her emotions, holds all her schemas there. So if, if she comes into therapy session saying, Ash, I, I feel awful, you know, I, I, my exam results come out and I, I have not done really well. This, this is horrible. So you know that she is in a vulnerable place. She's expressing her emotions. But more likely than not, she is probably coming there, going waffling off into this teleological pseudo intellectual mode, which we see within the schema lens as a coping mode. So the coping mode is very, it can be very detached, very avoidant, or it can overcompensate. So if I have got unrelenting standards, I can either be avoidant in my coping by not taking on any challenges, or I can overcompensate, take too much and try and do too much all the time. So in her case, in B's case, I guess her coping is hard to get. I, I, I'm fearful of intimacy. I'll miss classes. I will uh, stay too uh, further away from a potential boyfriend or a friend. Um, I will give up on therapy before it's even started properly. So that's her coping mechanism. So there is a lot of avoidance. There's a detached protector in there, which is um, cutting off from your emotions. Very robotic, mechanistic way of being. And um, perhaps she's also overcompensating at some level. You know, she's trying very hard in her mind to please that part of her that feels like is a failure. So the doll's metaphor, you can see that schemas uh, or schema mode model looks at our different parts. What is our child part, which has our emotions? It's got the, it's, it's one of our healthiest parts. Even the angry part of us is within the child mode. Um, the critic doesn't have a function as such, so it's not seen as a, it's more seen as a toxic part of the various modes, if you like. The coping mode is definitely a functional part of us. It helps us survive the very circumstances that give rise to our schemas. And the healthy adult mode that you see at the bottom of the slide is the part that is clearly rudimentary. When these patients initially come to us, there is not a big healthy adult mode. And um, talking, I mean, listening to some of the other speakers, when they talk about the observing eye, the mentalizing, um, you know, the part that he has got a bit of um, that stance where she's able to reflect on her experiences, that is the healthy adult part. So as a therapist, your role is to mimic what a healthy adult, what a good enough parent would have done for her. Um, and then eventually towards the later part of the therapy, she will be able to internalize it through that corrective emotional experience and take it on board. And her healthy adult part is a bit more enriched and not as rudimentary as before. So what we're seeing here, and sorry, th those things are moving around a bit, but you can see her vulnerable child part with all the schemas. The angry part um, hasn't come forth so much, but you do within BPD see a lot of angry child mode, the part that tries to advocate for the patient, but in a very um, dysfunctional way and can be very impulsive. The critic part usually is scathing and punitive with messages of you're damaged, you're too much, your feelings are bad, um, you know, you will be disliked if you express yourself and so forth. That's the critic. And the coping, like I've described, uh, could be avoiding, overcompensating, that type of a thing. So within um, the mode model, you can also formulate the self-harm from different angles. Not everybody's uh, self-harming behaviors uh, relate to the same cause. So for example, out of the pain of the vulnerable child, she might be cutting herself because it's too painful to exist like that. Or it might be an angry, impulsive thing. It's like, I'm so angry at you that you've uh, rejected me and I'm going to cut myself or I'm going to do something that is destructive. Or the critic, which is punishing the person. So she might uh, have this way of, I cut myself because I'm so bad. And I deserve this punishment. 
And the coping is, is the more common one, I guess. Uh, people, when they feel too numb out of being detached for too long, or uh, perhaps as a way of tolerating that emotional pain, they can take cutting or other self-harming behaviors. So what do you tend to do as a, a further step once you've got be in the room, you know, you've, you've kind of scaffolding some of this, you explore the schemas and unmet needs. There are a few questionnaires you can do. And, and, the, and the lighter part or the creative part I find with schema is that you do a lot of experiential work, imagery and chair work. And they can come in as part of your tools for treatment, but they can also be exploratory. They can also be for assessment. Um, so you might say, let's do an image of you in that playground you know you were talking about how it was a very difficult time for you in the playground let me see through your lens what what little b saw at that time what did she see what did she experience and so forth um the treatment approach uh, i don't know how i'm going for time ash you should tell me if uh, it's too long uh maybe just uh, an overview of this another minute or so yeah, yeah. So the key elements of uh, the strategies that are used in schema is imagery and chair work. And what you're trying to get across is either um, being um, sort of limited reparenting. So if the person is lacking in validation, um, support, advocacy, you're doing a lot of that. Um, and you're also providing a level of confrontation, empathic confrontation. So, for example, with the coping, if she's overcompensating, you might say, oh, I see that that part of you is very active today. Let's put that on the chair and start having a, a dialogue with it. So it's, it's a very creative, fun kind of thing. And you can either dramatize it and make it quite uh, like a psychodrama or you can tone it down and uh, make it more cognitive behavioral as well. So it's it's quite interesting. So mode mapping looks a little bit like this. And ideally, you would like the healthy adult to eventually nurture the child, put some limits on the parent or the critic mode, and have some way of flexibility around the coping mode. The coping modes are very stuck. You want them a little unstuck so that you have a little bit of wiggle room so that you can come um, to develop the healthy adult part through having these needs met. So these are some of the resources that people wanted. Um, yeah, that's the take from a schema angle. Thank you for that, Aparna. Uh, don't worry about the resources so much, guys. I'll be sharing all of them with you uh, by email. Um, so, but thank you for that. And uh, really, I mean, what you also highlighted is not just the formulation, but what do we do after that? Like, you know, how do we carry them through that uh, process of uh, understanding the mode, understanding their uh, their own, you know, which, which mode they're stuck in or which mode they need to move to. Um, and also like what you said in terms of the therapist stance is uh, modeling, modeling uh, and showing what can be an effective, good enough parent as it were. And uh, what can be an effective way of uh, functioning that that uh, helps them to, you know, evolve from one mode to the other. So I thought that was very helpful. Um, okay, shall we move on? And I, I can see some questions coming up, which is great. You can start bringing the questions in. I'm making a note of all of them. They're in the chat window as well. Um, but we will move to the DBT uh, model now. Nita, uh, over to you. And then we will. Uh, come to limitations and then open up a panel uh, for a discussion. So shall I start? A lot of it, right? Yeah. I'll just keep a timer for myself. Um, so, so we'll talk about Miss B. It's really interesting to see across different therapeutic um, modalities, how there are similarities and yet some amount of differences, right? So it's almost like we all are speaking the same thing, but in different languages, right? We are, we are saying the same content, but in different languages. And this reminds me about one of the DBT's therapeutic assumption is that clients do not fail therapy, right? Clients do not fail DBT. Therapy may not be adequate for them. DBT may fail them or a DBT therapist may fail them. It's not clients failing therapy. So this is one of the fundamental assumptions, which, which holds on to this truth that, that different languages 
make friends to different people right so to put it like how i like to put it everyone has a toothbrush and everyone likes their toothbrush not other people's toothbrush right not other person's toothbrush sometimes theoretical orientations are like that so i would i would like to keep that in mind uh, especially even after my presentation when we are taking this that, that we are all speaking the same stuff most more or less but in different languages and different clients may like i speak malayalam at home right i can understand kannada but malayalam sounds much more home to me right so so like that so when you are referring clients or when you are thinking about clients also that's something that you may want to keep in anyway so coming to formulation so i would start by putting the presenting complaints i'll try to get a little bit more behavioral specificity there then i will focus on the current circumstances and vulnerabilities so sort of fear and of focus wherein i am also looking at the current response to treatment how is this person coming to me for treatment how they are behaving in treatment even that would come as the current circumstances i'm not putting the things in in sentences because time i will focus on the developmental history where i'm looking from the lens of a biosocial model since i already spoke about it i'm not going to speak in detail i will look at what, what where does this client have that exquisite sensitivity to emotion when is she having high intensity uh, high frequency low return to baseline slow return to baseline i will also look at for example i think all of the other panelists have already spoken about um a father who responds to emotions by actively asking the client to shut down right because if they don't shut down there is anger and, and that's a problem a mother who does not have the emotional bandwidth to hold the client's emotion right so we we find these as themes of invalidating environment and as aparna was talking about these are not big t traumas these are drip drip small t traumas right and there is a pervasive pattern of invalidation and and how that transactional model has come so this is something that i would be keeping in mind while i am doing the pre treatment session with this person so in the pre treatment session i will have this conversation uh, wherein again this is very here and now right so i'm going to ask what so my idea is not that client should not commit suicide or should not die by suicide or should not do self harm my idea is how can i make this person's life worth living what can we both do to make a life worth living so i'm going to ask that i'm going to help her imagine that because sometimes clients do not are not able to imagine because they are they are in this trap of the uh, severe emotional dysregulation and cannot look at future sometimes clients ask what makes you think i can have a life worth living like like why do you think that i can have that so so sometimes this this conversation itself becomes task of therapy for initial few sessions i'm also looking at what comes in way of that and there we are looking at treatment targets so when i am looking at treatment targets i'm also keeping in mind is there an imminent threat to this person's life i am looking at what is the level of function is there any disability when i talk about severity i am looking at how is the subjective experience of distress for this person right how does she feel about all of this problems i am looking at pervasiveness across how many contexts does she have so in this uh, lady's case she has it in the context of interpersonal relationships and academics right so i am looking at across what context the problem occurs i am also looking at complexity is it only one diagnosis multiple diagnosis are there financial or other crises is also that is interwoven through all of this i am going to keep all of this when i am deciding to work on uh, treatment targets i think uh, some of i think aparna was talking about how clients with bpd have multiple problems they 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 fit all 18 schemas right or they come with multiple problems and dbt's answer to this kind of a picture is to is to keep treatment in stages so at any moment of time we are going to work on few treatment targets so otherwise i i i remember one of my clients saying this she has been in therapy for a year and she really liked her therapist and she felt that in therapy we made a lot of movement but from sideways to sideways i did not move ahead so every therapy session something happened but nothing got resolved so dbt's answer to that is to stage the treatment target so in stage 1 which i would say this client is wherein there is life threatening behavior therapy interfering behavior we saw how she shuts down in therapy and things like that life interfering behavior not going to college and stuff like that so our current focus would be getting her to a kind of behavioral control there are few other things like where and she feels extreme loneliness she is not able to tackle that that we will sort of move in the next treatment target so this this kind of stage approach is very um, important in dbt 
So as I said, my treatment targets would be life-threatening behaviors. In therapy-interfering behaviors, it's not just client's therapy-interfering behavior. Remember, it's a real relationship. What are the therapy-interfering behaviors I am bringing to the session? So when my client doesn't turn up for therapy, what do I do? How do I feel? Right? When my client repeats something, how am I sitting in the session? When she shuts down in the session, am I also just pushing for time? Right? So these are my therapy-interfering behavior, which also gets highlighted as equally important as my client's therapy-interfering behavior. So that's something that we need to keep in mind. And so apart from life-threatening behavior, therapy-interfering behavior of mine and the client, quality of life interfering behavior, what comes in way of our life. We also focus on some skills to increase. So as Ashlesha was telling earlier, skills is one part of DBT. That's not the whole of DBT. So in skill training component, I'll be focusing on distress tolerance because she's not able to cope. I'll be focusing on mindfulness because she's not able to name and sit with her emotions. So I would be focusing on mindfulness of emotion. I would be also working a little bit of emotion regulation and interpersonal effectiveness. But primarily, I would be going in this hierarchy. So I'm not trying to push skills to the client. I, I'd be going in this kind of hierarchy. So formulation is a living, breathing document. It will also involve component about how is my treatment going to meet all the criteria, all the functions of a DBT program and such like that. So I will start with the pre-treatment session. Like others said, it will take two to three sessions. And that's how we are going to make this formulation. Clarify history, life worth living conversation, communicate that via social model with the client in a Socratic way. Right? We take their input and make this model. And one of the things that I will really focus is to get a commitment to stay alive and stay in treatment. So I'll talk about some of the assumptions. I'll talk about the four hold that DBT people have. If you miss four sessions consist consecutively, you're out of the treatment program. I do all of it. I also talk about phone coaching, limits to that. And this, this, this bit is really important because if you remember this, you, you, this current psychiatrist, this is not the first psychiatrist or the second psychiatrist. She already shows difficulty in being with session. She, th there is a thing that when she finds the therapist is unavailable or judgmental, she stops coming for therapy. So how I would address it is probably, look, I'll say, look, you know what? I really want you to come for therapy, right? And there has been this pattern that this has happened in the previous therapy and we really don't want to work, come that between us. I really would love to work with you. So how can we prevent that, right? So there may be times when you feel that I am bored. Maybe I was bored. I need you to pull me up. I need you to let me know that that's happening. I need you to let me know that this is happening. So at any moment, we are going to press pause in therapy session. So if you feel I'm being judgmental, or I'm not liking you, or I'm, I'm misinterpreting you, or I'm misunderstanding you, I want you to just say press pause, or just say red card, and I'll stop. And I will also press pause when I feel you're shutting down. And we are going to learn to do that. Would that be okay? So, so I, I, I would address that in the pre-treatment session itself. I will not let it for later. Okay? I might give her a sample diary card like this. And the individual session, I'll just take two more minutes, I think, and I'll finish. We will move between acceptance, change, and dialectical strategy. So, so I'll come back to the formulation. We have not yet done with the formulation, okay? So before that, one of the things to remember is that validation is, is an important concept in DPT. So somebody asked Marsha Linehan once that if you were stuck in an island with a person with BPD and you could take only one strategy or skill with you, what would you do? Marsha really liked the question. She said that, okay, you're asking me for the aspirin of DPT. And she said, that's validation. Because her point was that it is in this, con in this, in this context of chronic invalidation that this person has this problem. And if you can validate stay with emotion, they may be able to sort of self-regulate and figure out the skills they need to cope in the island with you. So, so you spend a lot of time in validation. And one of the really important thing is when you validate, at different levels you can validate. So I think as somebody, Shivakami or Dharani was talking about, emotions are always valid. So that's something that we say. In, I think Ashlesha was talking. Emotions are always valid. Right, so we always validate emotions, right? So the point is we are trying to communicate that yes, this makes sense. And in every session, at least once, I try to communicate that in the context of the present situation, your emotional responses make sense. Yes, I can see the humanity, right? I can, I can, I can see how you feel this way. So, so difference between, um, okay, you are upset 
with your boyfriend not committing because of things that happened with your dad. Your dad moved away from your family, right? So that would be validating in the context of uh, past. The patient is having abandonment and rejection sensitivity. I'm validating that in the context of past. I can validate that in the context of present. Anyone would be upset if their partner is not committing to the relationship. That makes sense. So I would always try to see whether I can validate it in the present context, not just in the past. That is where the here and now comes. Now what I do is that when I'm starting with the formulation or the fundamental work that we do in this session is this thing called chain analysis. So here is where I am coming with my picture. Okay. So we start with, with every target behavior. Let's say we have decided self-harm or not attending college. So if that, when that happens, I look at what made her vulnerable that day? What prompted this? What was the problem behavior? What was the consequence? And then I'm looking at between the problem event and problem, prompting event and problem behavior, what thoughts you have? What emotions you have? What were the sensations you had in your body? How did the environment react? How did you act? And this will not come in the same lane. So you will find this kind of chain analysis. And this is what you're going to do over sessions. You compare across sessions and then you reach your secondary targets. So this is where like Shivakami has her, uh, uh, you put two things in the, po uh, in the poles. I have my things in the poles. I have three. So I, I would like to see, and this, for, for instance, I have not done this behavior analysis with this client, but one over the thing, I might be able to see uh, this pattern of uh, this biological vulnerability and invalidation and how over time she is invalidating herself. No, I should not have these feelings. I shouldn't be this, this one, right? And remember, with this kind of exquisite emotional pain, any therapeutic movement is going to come across as very painful and can come across as invalidating. So I would be on the lookout for that as well, because currently my client is trapped in a, in a nightmare of discontrol, right? So when there is this, the performance, whether they attend college or not, becomes completely unpredictable leads to disillusionment in the patient and the family members, right? Which leads to further invalidation. So I'm going to look out for those kind of stuff across my, um, across my uh, chain analysis. I'm, I'm also going to look at how certain things my client does, like she feels loneliness, she quickly gets into a relationship, leads to problem, crisis, underending crisis. She feels emotion, she shuts down, she doesn't grieve, she doesn't feel the emotion, which, which becomes like an automatic response to emotions. So I'm going to look at these things, active passivity, apparent competence, things like that across the model. So the idea is that we get some kind of insight. We look for solution in the chain analysis, and that could be anything. That could be a broad um, cognitive modification or managing some amount of contingencies or emotional exposure. Uh, so working with emotions, this is where uh, DBT can become very experiential, especially for that unrelenting crisis bit, wherein you work with emotions, you do emotional exposure, or it could be skill-based stuff. So it could be, you could work on your change procedure could be any of this. So acceptance, change, then you have dialectical stance that you take overall through this. So at any moment, I'm an analyst and a coach, and I'm flexibly moving between this position. So a DBT therapist is an analyst and a coach in the same session, right? Apart from this, I would be doing skill training, not in the individual session, ideally separately in a group format, which is like a class like this, like this we will be talking. There will be phone coaching to generalize skills and there will be a consultation team for me to keep my motivation up and to see my therapy interfering behavior. So in the consultation team, the focus is on me. So it's therapy for therapists to see what I'm doing, what I'm not doing, right? So this is in general, the formulation, how it looks like and how the work looks like. I know I have not, put in a lot of stuff on formulation. The dialectical dilemmas are where it becomes a little trickier, but that requires a little bit of more in-person work with the client to sort of reach there. So this is where I end. Thank you so much, Nita. I think, uh, you know, all of you have highlighted this and that's what you kind of referred to, isn't it? That formulation is not just a one-off thing. You're going to work together, but what you gave a really good overview is the approach to it. So it looks like, you know, you are not just telling them skills straight away you're saying okay you know we are going to put a hierarchy what is the priority for us to address and while we're addressing that what are the skills i can give you to start addressing that and moving to the next step so that was really helpful what i might just start with you nita since you're sort of 
finishing now, uh, and we'll, I'll ask this to all of you, is what might be some of the limitations that you feel, says, that you might uh, feel, okay, you know, DBT is not giving me this, I need to draw from somewhere else for something else when you're addressing uh, either this case or any of your clients where you felt there's a limitation. Uh, and, oh. and yeah, so if I can okay. ask you that question. So one thing is that DBT gives me a roadmap to how to go about stuff, right? So that, that way it's very handy. Where I think it can be better is that for stage two and stage three. So once I get that behavioral control in, how do I move ahead? For that, there is not much written. Stage two now with Melanie's, Melanie Harnett's work and uh, Martin Bohos's work, yes, some amount of stuff. But for stage three and four, it, it doesn't really have a uh, thing. So, so that, that, if you ask me, is one limitation of DBT. I would say stage two is covered. Uh, I, don't, I don't know whether you've seen Melanie Harnett's work, it's really interesting. Even Martin Bohus's work for, uh, this is really interesting. So for the uh, for the other people, Melanie Harnett has brought in a trauma treatment protocol to DBT. So one of the uh, um, problems with DBT was that it would not treat the trauma symptoms. So once you get the uh, behavioral control, what next? You need trauma treatment to move ahead. And that is when there are two approaches. So one, the prolonged exposure protocol is brought in. And another is Martin Bohus's approach, which is much more suited for CPTSD. So you have two different protocols for that. But that's new. That's relatively new. That takes a lot of training to do. And that's one of my problems with DBT. Another thing that I think practically that can burn out a therapist is phone coaching. Mm. So unless and until you are very comfortable setting limits, being flexible and firm with limits, phone coaching can burn a therapist out. And one of the difficulties that I find most therapists would have about taking up some protocol like DBT is phone coaching. So I would say stage three, four, not much information, not much evidence also, I would say. Second, I would say that um, this kind of phone coaching kind of thing, it's very intense work. My, I would also question whether all patients need that kind of intensity. Mm -hmm. So that that would be, so that would be one of my, Thing. And and it's also possible to DBT do to do DBT very mechanically, mm. but I think that's on the therapist rather than on the model. But it's okay. possible to do DBT very mechanically, and mm. and that's my personal pet peeve against this. Thank you so much, Nita. I mean, I I really uh, appreciate what you talked about phone coaching because when I was doing DBT, that was my fear. You know, oh my God, I'm giving my number to a client and telling them to call me between this time to that time. But you know what I found? I think what your point about how the therapist set the boundaries is important because I, I don't think I was very good at setting boundaries, but I had a limitation at home. Like I had a child. So I said, okay, you can't call me between this time and this time. And the, the client appreciated the boundary. Like I never got a call outside of the times that I had given the client. So I felt how the phone coaching is provided, of course, makes a difference, but that's very useful to know. And I also felt that, you know, DBT gives a very good initial structure. And then the later part is not very well defined, which is why I found myself looking for MBT and other things where I felt, okay, now that we've given them some tools, let's do some mentalizing work. So thank you for that. Uh, maybe I'll go to you, Dharani, since I'm talking about MBT. What do you find as a limitation uh, in, in MBT approach? There are a couple or a few things, just one of it is that while um, I think we use the past and what happened and the trauma in the past to develop an understanding of the current position of the client, there's not really much back and forth of, you know, how did that really influence you right now? There's no discussion about the past. It's more about the here and now and let's mentalize. And I think the aim is when you become reflective, you would also be reflective about your past experience. So it's not like an aim in therapy to make sense of your past. It's there, it's shaped you. Let's now work with mentalizing. We meet you where you are. So while that's very helpful for me, I also find um, not really talking about the past a bit of limited. Maybe that's more of me as a therapist. Um, the other part of it is what, um, while MBT does tell you that, you know, you have to work with emotional arousal, you need to bring down the emotional temperature in the room for mentalizing to occur. It doesn't really tell you the specific skills. It doesn't tell you you can use um, a grounding technique to help a dissociated client to come back in. It doesn't tell you what skills. So you will have to borrow that from other places. It's not part of the training. No one tells you these skills. Yeah. So you do have to adopt it from somewhere else and integrate it into your sessions to manage that. Um, 
and uh, with the clients that have been working with here in India, a lot of emotional awareness is it's very poor. So um, I find that their vocabulary itself is so stunted that you have to first start from the basics there to help them develop our emotional vocabulary, sensation wise, uh, and then get them to. But mentalization helps you to notice it. Um, I feel like it doesn't tell you how do you improve their vocabulary. Mm. So those are one of the things. Earlier, I used to have this difficulty with something like DBT, where uh, how do you address trauma now? You've done a certain amount of work with them. You've got them to mentalize currently. They're looking at their relationships more fully. But what about the trauma that has happened in the past? And I know right now that there is a separate module for trauma that is being de- that's been developed and there's training in that, uh, which helps you give the skills to handle trauma also. Uh, so yeah, MBT, with, those are some of the things that I find. Uh, and I feel like it's not really insight-oriented work, but it provides you the stepping stone for more insight-oriented work so that I'm building up the basic foundation for you to maintain a reflective stance. And then we can go into other work which um, helps you make sense, develop purpose or higher order, you know, any of those inside oriented work. So yeah, that was what I thought. Yeah, thank you. Because both, both of you are highlighting also with these limitations, how adapting this to the Indian context can be hard, right? So if... Uh, our uh, clients in India, especially, but I think anywhere, if they don't have a language for emotional regulation, I think MBT kind of uh, gives one of the main core things we are going to teach you to mentalize. And how you then lead your life after mentalizing better is up to you. So you will be comfortable with your choices once you have started mentalizing. But in India, they might expect us to do more. Now, now you taught me to mentalize. Now tell me what to do next. So there is a expectation from our therapists uh, more and the same thing with dbt they might expect you to do more phone coaching be available more because you're you're there on the phone so i think uh, the limitations can also become a little bit more of a problem in the indian context right uh, thank you for that uh, who wants to go next shivakami do you want to tell us about your limitation or what you find is a limitation with cat uh, in general or with the indian population yeah um I'm going to say that Bamos are really very tempted now, like, because this whole topic of language and the Indian context has come up, like, that's something that I think I've thought so much about even before I started training in CAT. Um, But I'm just going to now stick to limitation, what I think can be challenging using CAT. And maybe at some point we'll come back to this. So I was more thinking of this particular case vignette and this person. So one thing is that I think a cat can become quite cognitive very easily, uh, especially if somebody is sort of cut off in a very cut off state. And uh, I don't think it's something to do with the, I mean, it's not, it's not, I think the model can open up for more, but it would, it can easily become like that. So it would require the therapist to really pick up pick that up early on, uh, even during the assessment or uh, early in the early sessions itself. So, so that the therapist and the client don't land in that sort of a space where they've come up with this beautiful understanding, but it's just, it doesn't really connect with that person emotionally. So that is one thing. I think the other two, maybe it has something to do with time. Um, something about how cat is a very brief and intensive sort of therapy. So it's quite an active engagement for both the therapist and the patient um, or client. And I think for some people that can feel like a lot. Mm. Um, So Mm. some people, because typically for somebody like this, we might propose 16 or 24 sessions across six months, um, four or six months. And somebody might find that as a lot. So then it might make sense to say, invite them to participate maybe in the first stage, see what it's like, come up with a formula, like a reformulation and then see if, you know, if there's something that both of, both the therapist and the client can proceed with. So that's a possibility. On the contrary, it can also feel like there's not enough time. So somebody might need longer period so if you think of something like mbt which is a year year and a half long or two year long uh somebody might need that i think or longer forms of therapy like psychodynamic work or something like that where 
they need that kind of space. Um, so these are a few things that came to my mind. Um, but I also thought I'd just quickly uh, maybe respond to what um, Neeta and Dharani were bringing up with regards to, I was thinking how maybe getting a balance in therapies of you know top down, bottom up as everyone seems to talk about that. So I think CAT in a way um, is quite flexible in that sense. I think it allows the therapist to stay at different places and there's room for trauma work and th things like that but that's all more not the limitation i was just kind of thinking about the points that they brought up and how cat might respond to that oh no it's a very important limitation uh, especially in the indian context where you know clinicians and therapists and doctors and psychiatrists may not yet be ready to drop the hierarchy like i think and and clients also Right. I feel like they come with this that, you know, better, you tell us what to do. And we are saying, no, no, we are, we have to try a collaborative approach. We are going to figure it out together. So that itself can become a limitation sometimes from the client's expectation point of view. And what I've also noticed is uh, from a therapist stance, sometimes it's difficult for us to, um, where was it? I don't know who it was. Maybe it was you only, uh, Shivakami, who was saying that it's a slow unravel. I don't know which one of you said that. Sometimes when we hear the client's story, like what you might have heard, we already have an understanding and we might start with our understanding. Often we have to go to the client's space of not knowing, not understanding and bring them to our level of understanding. So we do need to drop our expert stance and it's not easy to do that. I think so. Uh, but, but, but what you said was, I know that, that, that can actually be very helpful if you are approaching from these therapeutic approaches. It's important to keep that in mind. Uh, thank you for, sorry, you want to say something else? Shivakam? Yeah, I was just saying, I think every therapy model possibly actually gives that, that sort of a safety for the therapist, possibly, at least in CAT, I find that in the, even in, I mean, certainly in the Indian context, the CAT invites the therapist to go along with the person wherever they are. So I think to be able to openly talk about even that power imbalance, possibly, uh, I think can, it seems to help is what I think. Thank you for that. Aparna, over to you. What do you find are the limitations of schema-focused therapy? It's been a steep learning curve, I think. Uh, you know, working, like I said, in a public mental health setting where you don't have a traditional uh, psychotherapy sort of format to do a full-fledged therapy. Um, you know, I had to overcome my own sort of uh, limitations in trying to use whatever uh, the um, strategies are. Sorry, that's Bella going off in the background. Okay. Um, I think in a sense. traditional sense, you, you have schema therapy as a longer term approach. I do a very brief short term approach, which might take care of your formulation, that psychoeducative part and some tools, but doesn't see through the whole one, two year format. So that's my own limitation, I guess. Um, the other thing that often schema therapists talk about is the avoidance to do that experiential work. Mm -hmm. So chair work and imagery needs you to be quite active and creative on the spur of the moment. Um, for someone who's a little bit on the shyer part of uh, the temperament scale, like myself, it can be like, oh, maybe not today, next week. And that's that's not really helpful. Mm -hmm. You can only validate so much. There is certain strategies to do confrontation work, the difficult part of saying, look, yes, this helped you survive, but now we have to find some wiggle room there so that we can move beyond the scoping. So I think it's overcoming my own limitations in that way. The more recent sort of updates to schema therapy is finding the strength-based schemas or the adaptive schemas. And I think I have to upskill myself in that. And it's beautiful to bring along to the person that, yes, these are the maladaptive schemas, but you also have got certain strengths and certain adaptive schemas. And how can they both sort of coexist or how can these um, holistic sort of view help us have a more a rounded um, impression of yourself or your functioning? So I, th I think it's it's been a steep learning curve. I'm sure as a guru of schema therapy will tell you more, but I, I love the approach. So Maybe it's more, more more my own limitations than the therapeutic limitation. 
Thank you for that, Aparna. No, what you're also saying is that, I guess, and all of you kind of highlighted that a little bit, that people who develop these therapies also started recognizing the limitations and they're already working on them, right? So someone recognized there's not much work in trauma in DBT and started working on it in MBT as well. And someone might have recognized in schema-focused therapy that there's not enough strength-based schema, so let's work on that and bring it in. So the limitations are being understood and they are being worked upon. And hopefully that gets translated down to the therapists as well. Okay, we do we do want to have a more interaction now and we already have some questions. So I will start uh, addressing the questions. Thank you everyone for patiently listening. I know it's a bit of a marathon and it's a bit, a bit of a, you know, uh, pop foray and jumbling up of different uh, approaches, but really, uh, this is kind of an experience I wanted to give to what is out there for our clients, right? They hear these things. We hear these things. We may, you may have not got a full picture of every single therapy, but just an understanding to see that there are commonalities in all approaches because the, the common things have happened to our clients. You know, there is an attachment trauma, there is invalidation, there is development of certain core beliefs and certain schemas. But it's important that there are different approaches because our therapist styles are different, our clients' needs are different. And that's why it's important to uh, appreciate and highlight all these different approaches. Uh, I'll start with you, Shivakami. There's a question that Sneha had put up when you had shared your formulation. I don't know if you're there or if you've gone away to take a break. Um, she was uh, uh, asking about when you have this uh, formulation or this map for your client, uh, how do you, how does an exit occur? Like the map kind of gave an idea of uh, where they're tied in, the control, the blame. How does an exit occur? Uh, are you there, Shivakami? Yes. So there's a question from Snehal. Yeah. So yeah, I can take that question. Um, I'm just going to look at it. How, where do exits come here in these maps is what so, you um, Maybe I can just share the map and just point to that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Can I also request people to switch on their videos? And if you want to introduce yourself while you're asking the question on the chat window, that would be good. If you want to raise your hand so you can ask your question directly, that would be good. Uh, if you have your videos on, we can take a screenshot to appreciate your presence here today. So that would be good if you can turn on your videos um, just so that the uh, panelists also feel like they're talking to 3D people, 2D people. Hi, Snehal. Uh, hmm. Ah, okay. There it is. Can you see the map? Yes. yes. Okay. So what is very, uh, what is really missing from this map is the more middle part, which would be the healthier, uh, more healthy reciprocal roles. And uh, typically you could put it on a separate piece of paper, like somebody's healthy island or healthy space. And that's where the exits kind of, you know, you could put it in a box or you could, you could do really anything with it in, in a way, but that's where it would come. And I think, so that would go somewhere in the middle. And the exits can look like many things. Actually, CAT is, again, uh, it is an integrated psychotherapy model. So, and a lot of CAT therapists seem to typically have backgrounds from in other therapies. So people may bring in like skills from other, like chair work or DBT type work or things or mindfulness, things like that. And uh, that would, they can different things can form part of the exits. Um, does that answer your questions? Yes, it does. To... Yes, it does. Thank you so much. Uh, Snehal, do you want to just quickly introduce yourself? You had a couple of other questions. You can uh, ask them as well while we're here. Yeah. Uh, hi, my name is Snehal, and uh, I run an initiative called Cozy Hope. We are in the mental health space. I have a co founder with me and uh, we both believe in doing work with a uh, trauma focused uh, lens and understand various ways of working. Uh, I'm quite eclectic in the way I work. Uh, I've been in this uh, field for the past uh, 13 years now. Um, and uh, yeah, and that's also one of the reasons why I posed the next question that I did. So Shlesha, can I uh, also 
take the next question if that's okay yeah so uh, so i often when i'm working with uh, clients who have a diagnosis of cd or uh, even cdsd even after we terminate the work after few years they contact again okay it's almost like uh, you know they are still looking for more work to be done so there's substantial amount of work that we have done for say sometimes even 2 to 2 and a half years or even more and then we have uh, you know we have weaned off and then we have taken a break and after termination this happens so i was very curious to understand your approaches uh, if this happens how is it that you deal with it uh, is there a, it's like a it is it like a mini capsule that can be uh, said that okay we worked on this 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 uh, we look back uh, often times it is uh, it's the need to connect to the therapist once again um uh, so i don't know sometimes i wonder uh, you know have i not done enough uh, that this is you know the client is still there or but i can see that the client is still not there uh, sometimes i find it very rude so it it feels like you know their file opens up and feels like oh i'd be doing the same things that probably that they have experienced uh, because of you know socially what has happened and all of those things so i find myself in an ethical dilemma there uh, uh, but i don't know so i wanted to check thank you for that i don't know if anyone specifically wants to respond to that when the clients I'll return just yes apan probably briefly mention the idea of doing booster sessions and uh, because i said earlier i do a briefer format i tend to often tell patients look in a year's time we, let's catch up for a booster session we might do just four of them or in a couple of years we'll do something and it often is that they they've already upskilled themselves in their own way because they've used some of the skills we've already talked about but then they're very grateful for that extra bit of yes you know th this these are the modes yes this mode was much more prominent when you were in crisis oh this is how you're doing it and it, it becomes a little bit of um, a grounding exercise again in that corrective emotional experience so i often offer it to the patients um so it it comes back as not necessarily i i know the feeling of oh gosh you know uh, hasn't the initial part worked properly uh but it's it's a good sign i think that they're coming back to yeah. you that there there is a recognition of you know we we've had that therapeutic rapport i trust you i can come back to you kind of thing that's my take on it i would imagine snail Cheers. Absolutely. I think that's kind of recommended in most therapies. Uh, traditionally, when not much evidence was there for the shorter forms of therapy, the idea was, oh, personality disorder, very difficult. They have to stay years together in therapy. The evidence is telling us you do as much as your therapy stance dictates, 12 months, 6 months, you know, uh, 12 sessions, 24 sessions. And then they go away. They try those skills. They live their life. You know, they may, next time a crisis occurs, they may not fall apart so badly. they may just come back for a little bit of support and you support them based on your capacity and your understanding Ref have a reframe work and then do a little bit more work if you can so the booster sessions is a good format and i think that's kind of dictated in other forms of therapy as well so does that answer your question sneha yes it does it does okay i'm going Thank to you. move to someone else's questions sneha and i'll come back to you uh i know you've asked about uh what was it finding purpose for the clients i'll come back to that we'll just go to another question okay. um i i know there are some hands raised uh, kanika is it with relevant to what's been talked about or are you okay to wait for your question okay and purnima are you okay to wait for your question as well or did you want to respond to something that was being said tension to what snehal was asking so just an extension like because like for example what i was hearing that you know uh, especially when we talk about mbt and pbt so um like what gardni was saying that we mbt doesn't contain a lot of skills but dbt does so let's say like if a client is coming when we have terminated mbt therapy with the client and the client requires more of skills when they are coming back to us so how much i, I would like to just know how much you have seen referring to another therapy expert who will be able to work with them because we like for example as an empathy practitioner i'm exhausted with whatever i could do with the empathy skills right so do you have any experience or any complaints on that so what you're asking uh, uh, anyone in the panel can respond if you want to that if if you have if they've come back to you 
and you felt like, okay, this, this looks like something that is out, outside the expertise of what I'm able to offer. So maybe I need to refer to someone else. Is that something that's happened? Is that something that you're likely to do? Anyone in the panel wants to uh, respond to that? I can say yes. it. Usually, um, if I work with a client for a long period of time and I feel like I've done what I could do, um, when they're coming back, the first thing is to see what are they coming back for? What is the current thing crisis? What is the reason they've come back to therapy first? So if it's something related to the work I've already done and I can continue and help them kind of refocus and refresh the part of what we were discussing, then I would do that for a couple of sessions or a few sessions. But sometimes with MBT, I might feel like if clients is coming for say processing of past trauma or may feel like, you know, I want to do insight oriented work then I might actually refer them on for that. I feel like, okay, now the mentalization has stabilized. You are suited for more deeper, say maybe psychodynamic work and maybe someone else who's doing it would be, you know, a good for you. And that would be the next level for you. So you can refer out is also what I would think. I Yeah. And also what I like to talk about, you can also refer them to family therapy because the system then can get addressed, right? And you might have done individual work and you might now, maybe uh, they can do some couples work or some, some work with someone else along to understand uh, the different uh, dysfunctions. So that actually kind of uh, also uh, brings us to the next question that Avinash Kamath is asking. Avinash, do you want to introduce yourself? You're also kind of addressing something that you're talking about now, not just when they come back, but how do we know if they're ready for therapy? Uh, and because they're just going from one crisis to another, are they ready for therapy? Is this a good time for therapy? When is a good time for therapy? Is that what you're asking, Avinash? Do you want to just uh, and clarify the question? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, I would like to actually uh, have your viewpoint also on this, Dr. Ashlisha, because uh, there is always this confusion whether uh, family work is something that has to happen all uh, on, on the side along with when this therapy is happening, or is it after when the client is ready, or is it before, right? So uh, I would like to have a little bit of take on that. And also uh, where I'm coming uh, uh, for Sorry, Avinash, question. I might interrupt you. Can you introduce yourself so people can yeah, kind of hi. get yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm Dr. Avinash. I'm a, a practicing child and adults in psychiatrist. I was in Manipal before. Now I'm in Mangalore, uh, just starting off uh, child practice. Uh, so um, uh, many a times uh, uh, the experience for us has been from uh, working with student population back in uh, Manipal and uh, uh, that's how uh, uh, one of the uh, one of the things that I remember uh, a very senior consultant uh, who has worked with this uh, population for a long time saying is that uh, the therapist or, uh, or the practitioners often feel uh, kind of cheated because uh, they spend quite some time intensely with these clients and then when there's when the crisis is gone they just actually fizzle out of the system or they have other life uh, things kind of happening for them that you know take out their priorities and they are not really focused focusing on working on themselves or other things. So they actually come back to you in another crisis. So, uh, so you feel that, you know, you are kind of just that for that. Uh, you just uh, put a band-aid and send yes, them off. Yes, band-aid and then send them off. Well, that's fa fairly okay. Uh, but that's, that's very clearly not what uh, possibly is required. And uh, that, that's where it sometimes becomes often challenging for us to kind of make, a uh, make that kind of a link with the ther therapist and referral. Uh, and it is uh, really confusing uh, what would be the right point uh, ideally of course if you have a luxury of team kind of an approach everything happens simultaneously but we don't live in that uh, situation so what would be the kind of uh, uh, take so i'll ask the panelists if anyone wants to respond to that and then i can address the family and the psychiatrist referral question but does anyone in the panel want to respond yeah can uh, I yes shivaka i was immediately thinking of a team approach um I think Dr. Avinash brought that up. So in my setup, I think um, I work with other psychiatrists. So I think we can we can do much better with crisis management, but I think um, that's the support I get so that therapy doesn't become only to manage crisis. Um, I think that is greatly supportive, but I'm aware that that sort of a resource may not be available everywhere. But with regards to the broader question of who is ready for therapy, when is somebody ready for therapy? I think um, at least with the CAT framework, how it might be looked at is that say somebody's motivation towards attending something like therapy, again, is something very dynamic and it can be looked at as something that develops even during therapy. So um, it's, 
that's something that I again liked about CAT uh, and, and about how the therapeutic assessment becomes the very first opportunity where you start having that sort of a conversation with somebody. And somebody may, the people may respond in different stages, uh, but to look at motivation as something that, and also whether uh, in terms of whether if they're going to go into crisis repeatedly, then maybe they need some more direct sort of support, which may be something like DBT type work. Mm. But I think there are some broad set of skills that different therapists can bring in. Uh, they may need that, that may need to be the focus, um, and then to keep going with whatever else happens in different therapies. So that's how I look at it. Um, and yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. And I think, uh, I mean, Ash, that's, I mean, even when we don't have a team, what we tend to do is refer to the psychologist, but work with them as if they are a team, as we are a team. So the men end up not be working with you, but working collaboratively can be helpful. Uh, of course, it's very difficult when they may not want to see someone else they only want to come to you and then they feel like, okay, I know it's okay. You just, you talk to me and I'll be okay for now. They may not be very keen to see someone else at that time. And the risk is high. The therapist may not be able to just do the therapy work, may also rely heavily on the psychiatric support. Uh, but I think it's actually, I think I like what you said, Shivakami. It might be helpful for the therapist to get involved even during the crisis, even if they're not going to do deep work. They may not get down to the deeper part of it, but be doing the supportive work so that the engagement starts, you know, the trust building starts. So when the crisis is dissipating, then they start becoming comfortable to talk about what they do need to talk about. And then they don't have to start from fresh. And then they don't have to feel like, okay, I don't have a problem. I'm not going to start telling you everything and relive my trauma. So I think it might be helpful for the therapist to get involved during the crisis, but need not do deep work straight away. They might just be providing a holding containing environment. Like DBT definitely has a lot of structure in containing and not necessarily doing anything more beyond just managing the crisis. And whichever therapy approach, maybe I think uh, what we also heard is the therapists have uh, an adaptive model, collaborative model. They're not going to just do what they need to do. They're going to see, okay, what is this person presenting with? Is this uh, kind of presentation? They're very upregulated. I'm going to first help them to uh, regulate better. Then we'll do some deeper work. So I think working uh, referring straight away, even if they're coming during crisis might be helpful, but working collaboratively, even if they're not in your team and encouraging them to, uh, whichever clinician you refer, encouraging them to stay connected with you. And especially when you're working with personality disorder, it's important that the clinicians work together because there might be a tendency of splitting. Uh, you know, you are uh, not as good as that one. That's not a good, as good as this one. It just comes from the pathology and what they've experienced. So I think collaborative care is very important. Uh, with respond to your family question, it's a, it's a very difficult uh, thing. We've tried all sorts of approaches. So what we do with our MBT group is we uh, talk to the families alongside the group therapy. And it's interesting how the group uh, responds. So the last group, we had an adolescent group and we said, we are going to talk to your families every month. And they didn't have much of a say because they were younger. This group, I've already had, I don't know, six to eight sessions. And they're like, no, 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 don't talk to our families yet. Wait, wait, wait. You know, they're adults. They're some in their 30s. And they're like, why the hell? I've disconnected from my family long ago. Why do you want to bring, your, bring my family in? But I think, so what we are trying to say is someone in your system, we need to start addressing because the problem doesn't lie only in you. So some form of engagement of the system needs to start happening from the very beginning. You might do it in education, psychoeducation. You know, they're not being manipulative. They're just distressed and they're trying to find resources to get help. So even if you can change the language that is being used around BPD by the family members, you know, she's attention seeking, she's manipulative, uh, she's just doing this uh, because she's lazy. So sometimes just education might be a starting point for involving families. And then as the therapy, pro they get engaged with the individual therapist, then giving the family more tools to help them can be helpful. But initially getting the families involved, I think is very helpful. And it need not be family of origin. It could be spouses. It could be like, I know many uh, clients with BPD have disconnected from their families. They've disconnected from everyone. They just have a very close friend and their work network and maybe, you know, a couple of uh, uh, colleagues who are their support system. So that could be the people you could involve. Whoever is going to be there when the crisis occurs, whoever is going to be there, that's going to trigger something. So I think that is what I would say. I don't know if, is that answering your question, Dr. Avinash? 
I would just like to add something. Yes, yes, please. Do. Yeah. So, Avinash, your question was about when to refer. So, so that, as Shivakami was talking about, is a basic readiness question that we ask. So, one of the things that I think DBT does, and I, I would say that's the strength of it, is this focus on getting commitment to therapy. So, it assumes, so if you look at the diary card, I had put a question, urge to quit therapy. So, motivation is dynamic. It grows during the therapy and it fluctuates. So, one of the things that I would do every session is to check how, how likely are you to come for the next session? How did you feel about coming to this session today? So I'm going to keep that commitment and motivation as a thing that I keep throughout the session and not just their commitment and motivation, mine as well. That's why I attend my team meeting, right? So that's one thing. So, and, and some contingencies that I have in place, like phone coaching is usually a very rewarding thing for them, but you get that only if you're coming for session. So the relationship becomes a very warm, nurturing place. So that's why I started with validation. So getting that four miss rule. So I have the four miss rule. If you miss four sessions consecutively, you're out of my treatment program. You may not be able to get in. But within that four misses, I'm going to do my level best to get you back in treatment. So, so th th there are going to be checks and balances like that, that I think most therapies would have about getting people back. That's one. And I think you would know that uh, when we do adolescent work, one of the things DPT does is in the skill training thing, you have the adolescent and family members coming together, parents coming together, and sitting and attending the skill mod, skill class, which is really, really interesting to see how parents and adolescents, and, and it's very beautiful to see over the course of time, how they all learn to develop a language to speak. So that, that's really interesting. But I've not been able to have a multifamily group yet because adolescent, especially in the Indian context, there is a sphere of stigma. So what I do is I have one adolescent, their parent, and they come for skill training separately. This is separate from the adolescent's individual session. So I may do a, half an hour extra sometime in the week or immediately after the session or something like that. So that sort of thing works. And again, this is where I would say that systemic perspective is really important when you work with um, BPD clients. Yes, thank you for that, Neeta. I mean, I think we've tried the multifamily thing where we have all the families coming together and whose kids are involved in our group or spouses. And it actually uh, both helps and hinders the stigma because then they're able to, one is they're able to uh, connect with each other, empathize with each other. The other is they're also able to see, oh, your daughter was doing this. Now she's not doing it anymore, which means that maybe there's hope for my daughter, you know. Oh, look, your daughter's gone to college already and she's so, that is very powerful as well and it can be helpful. Uh, so thank you for that. There's a question for you, Shivakami, about evidence for cat, uh, cat why there's uh, like less evidence compared to the other therapies. I don't know if because you're the spokesperson for CAT, whether you can take the blame for it, but it's addressed to you. So do you want to take that? Sorry, uh, I'll just pause you here. So we yeah. have around eight minutes remaining. So yeah, just finish. Sorry. Yeah. So I what I might say is if people do need to leave after one week, you can. I will we'll try and address all the questions if we can. And you can also email questions to us and we'll share it with the panelists so they can share it with you. But uh, are we okay to uh, address all the questions before we stop? Even if we go a little bit over, is that is everyone okay with that? The panelists? Okay. Uh, right. So, Shiva, coming for you. Yeah, I think I can describe CAT's evidence base as something that's expanding. There is, uh, there are, uh, I mean, if you think of the levels of evidence in modern healthcare with RCT being in the top and maybe meta-analysis being something higher than that. Uh, there are RCTs uh, looking into, since we are speaking about personality disorder, borderline personality disorder, there are RCTs looking into effectiveness of CAT in um, uh, this group of uh, clients. Um, I don't know how exactly it compares with what is out there for DBT. Uh, I think perhaps DBT is, the, I, I, I really can't comment about that in a way because I'm not very sure about the numbers or how exactly it compares. But what I do know about CAT and the story of evidence in CAT is that, so, and there's a paper on this, um, when they did a sort of systematic review of whatever is out there for CAT, they found that there's a lot of practice-based evidence as opposed to these kind of RCTs and so on. And that's how it has sort of, um, come into mainstream work within the NHS in the UK and in Australia. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think in Australia, there's a lot of work now, especially with young people, 
uh, and they are systematically uh, researching the effectiveness on the ground. So there's a lot more on the clinical effectiveness end in that sense. In that sense. But there's a clear recognition in the community, as far as I can see, that there's need for more kind of evidence from this end. And uh, I think there's a lot come, there seem to be a lot getting published almost every year and a lot, especially in personality disorders. And I can send across a few papers if that's of interest. Yes, that would be very helpful, Shivakami. Thank you for that. Um, I'll go to the next question, which... Uh, Someone, PB, I don't know your name fully. So if you want to introduce yourself, it's also another same question that has been sent to me directly by Ruchi Raina. So uh, can, do you want to introduce yourself and ask your question about validation? Yes, I can do that. Uh, hi, I'm Prema uh, and uh, I'm a practicing psychotherapist. Uh, so uh, yeah, I, I think uh, we all um, do believe that uh, validation is an integral part of uh, dealing with uh, BPD. Um, if it comes early on, I, I'm thinking if it comes early on in uh, early um, early adult, uh, early child, uh, young adult stage, it seems like um, that can be uh, process. It feels like it can be processed differently in the sense that uh, being able to process and then move on uh, uh, seems uh, seems uh, le less less. Uh, of work than when it comes later in uh, adulthood, which means that there's a lot of validation needs to happen and also life needs to move on, which is go and find a job, be consistent and um, take care of yourself. So um, uh, I, I'm just thinking uh, what, what approach would help moving forward and validation hold a place? How would we balance that? Um, that's my question. So you're talking about the limitations of validation. Does anyone want to Correct. respond? Yeah. And how do we hold that in helping the... Thank you, Aparna. Yes, Aparna, you can ask. Yes. I think uh, that's a very good question. And the dilemma of how far do you be the supportive, validative, comfortable space versus how far do you go around uh, being confrontational even or being more assertive? pushing for change. So it's always a bit of a um, pros and cons to each session. I'd imagine the early part of therapy being a lot more around the supportive stance, but then if that carries on beyond its time, then it becomes stalemate. You, you don't produce any change. The person comes back very compliant and uh, you're present and you're validating and there is no room for change. So the empathic confrontation part of schema therapy gives a strategy to move into that space of actually confronting the maladaptive behaviors and looking for change. Um, and it's done in a way that is very empathic. You, you look at when if it's a coping mode, most likely, then you look at the pros and cons of the coping mode and you go, oh, so this is how it's really helped you uh, maintain a level of um, stability in your early childhood or whatever, if it's overcompensating and trying to really overcome the failure schema, for example. And then you go, but what, what are the cons of it? And the person might say, I get burnt out. You know, I, I am staying up at uh, 10 o'clock in the night. There's no work-life balance and so on and so forth. So I think moving from beyond validation towards uh, change is, is definitely uh, addressed in that empathic confrontation part of schema therapy. I'm sure other modalities have other ways of doing it. Yes, I don't know if I've you answered that. your question, Prema. No, uh, I, I, I think... Sorry, hang on, hang on. But so Dharani and then Nita. Right, so I was just kind of agreeing with Aparna and that, that the empathic validation, at least in MBT, is used initially to um, reduce the affect and to reduce, you know, to it's like an opening point. You're saying they're very aroused and they're very angry or upset about something. So you use very empathic validation to lower the emotional temperature, stabilize mentalizing. And then you go ahead with the next question that Aparna was talking about, you know, uh, let's look at this a little bit more. What just happened there? Or you know, is this how it, how did you make sense of this? It's a very um, curious and not, I mean, it is a kind of confrontation You're trying to ask them, how did they come to a particular conclusion? How did they know something? Um, 
how did it how did they draw meaning from it but it is done the empathic validation is the first step it is not the be all and end all of it you move beyond the validation and you go to asking them about exploring and uh, understanding how they made the inter interpretations or their infer inferences thank you for that uh, nita you want to add some yeah so since I said that validation is the aspirin of DBT, I think I need to answer this question. So yes. the, the thing is, if you look at validation, right? Validation is not just empathy. Validation is communicating, yes, this makes sense. Yes, your behavior makes sense. So what are we validating? We can validate a person's behavior. We can validate a person's feeling. We can validate a person's thoughts, right? You can validate any three of them. You can validate the thought and not validate the action, right? I, I, I can see why you get angry, but I'm not sure throwing that phone at your spouse was the best idea at that moment. You can validate that, moment, right? I, I, can, I can see why you got angry, right? I, I would have gotten angry as well, but it doesn't really make sense to throw the phone at that moment. Or that's a out there example. Or let's say that um, my client is talking about something. Let's say we, I, I'll take an example of my client who has this, uh, shame related one behavior where she does something sexual and that it's a lot of shame so she's talking about it and then she shuts down right she's not looking at me she's staying there so i'll say okay but let's take a pause let's see what is happening it looks like there is a lot of emotion firing at this moment can we stay back see what is happening go slow then she might tell me one or two things about sensation let's say so it looks like shame it looks like a lot of or I might ask her, do, do you have a word for this emotion? So she might say shame. Okay, so it looks like a lot of shame is firing. That makes sense, right? That makes sense that, sh that you feel shame when you talk about this. But with shame, what is that action urge that you're having? So I validated the shame, made, said that it makes sense. Then I'm asking her, what is the action urge? So she's not looking at me. So I will highlight that. Looks like you're having the shame and you're not looking at me. There is this urge to pull back. So the action urge of shame for you right now is to pull back, right? And here is the thing. If you pull back now, you're going to feel worse after the session. So what can, so what do you need right now? Do you know what you need right now? So I'm consulting to the client. I'm, I'm trying to drag that new behavior from. Do you know what you need right now? And then I get that. So, so validation is not the only thing. So you pair validation with a lot of other stuff as well, right? But non-contingent positive regard has to be your baseline. Absolutely. Has to be a baseline. Non-contingent positive regard has to be a baseline as a therapist. I don't see any other way we can work with any human being. Right? That's. I think the point you made is really valid. And what I remember learning also is that you validate the valid. You're not validating valid. everything. You're not validating self-harm, but you validate their desperation okay. for and the pain they are feeling that leads to self-harm. So just because we are validating, we are we're saying we understand that you need to do this. That doesn't mean we agree that you should do it. We are sort of recognizing that these are the resources for at your disposal. So let's see. We understand the pain and it. So you validate the emotions, not necessarily the actions, right? And uh, I think all of you kind of said that you also need to move with. Uh, so initially, they may not be ready for confrontation and challenges. You may need to first just validate and be there for them. Have unconditional positive regard. You keep the unconditional positive regard, but use that as a foundation for then saying, okay, you know, you tried this, it didn't work. What can you do instead? So then you, once they have enough trust on you, you can start the uh, challenging, the confrontation. Also, I don't know, Nita, if this is there in DBT. I remember one of the uh, assumptions or you what you teach them is you may not have caused all your problems, but you're going to have to solve them. To solve right? them. So in you're, in you're validating that you have arrived here, not because of your, your behavior, because of other people's behavior, but from here, you are the one who has to move forward. And so you keep validating that they're distressed, but you also encourage that despite the distress, they're going to have to do something more, something better. Yeah. Right? And that is in hard. Fact, and that is also the dialectic that you're working with. In fact, when I do the skill training sessions, I make them read one assumption per day sometimes. And so we go through these assumptions on a daily basis. So one day, one assumption we read out loud and we sit on it a little bit. This is one of my favorite ones. Yes. Thank you for that. And I hope that addresses your question. Uh, I think two of you had asked, Ruchi also had asked about limitations of uh, validation. 
Uh, we also have a question from Divya Tiwari. Uh, Divya, I, I kind of feel like I need to link it to what we're just talking about because you're, what Divya is asking is a lot of conversation. We are talking about past experiences. All of, uh, you know, we talked about schemas and what has happened as invalidation. What, what about current experiences when there is invalidation now in you know, society, gender uh, roles, expectations from work, for example, whatever is invalidation that's going on now. And this is a question my clients ask me. You know, you're teaching us to mentalize. We go out there and there are some hundred people who are not mentalizing. Who's going to teach them? You know, what are we going to do with them? And it's a big question that they ask, you know, what about now? Now we are experiencing this. And because they are vulnerable now, uh, they, you know, they feel invalidated quicker. They feel rejected quicker with this bad behavior that's happening around them. So any anyone has any ideas or thoughts of how do you help them navigate their current traumatic experiences? Yes, Aparna. Um, from a schema therapy angle, I guess that is the fertile ground for work, the current triggers. So if there is a confrontation with a partner or a workplace rejection or uh, um, a dismissive rejecting slant from somebody and that triggers you, that becomes your, um, I suppose, your session work, if you like. Mm -hmm. So you're not living in a perfect world where there are not going to be triggers. There are going to be triggers left, right and center of rejection, of abandonment, of failure and all of that. The key is... Can you provide them with a corrective experience in the current trigger? So in the past, you know, when mom was extremely highly critical and expecting a lot, you know, the child part of B must have gone and overcompensated and approval sought from mom at the uh, cost of her own needs and her own emotions. That was the past. But in the current trigger, when similar things happens with a husband or a partner or a boss, then you're trying to navigate and play a good enough parent. And in that regard, the therapist might say, hey, hold on, your critic is asking too much of you. Or hold on, you know, you might want to nurture the inner child um, and say something like, you too deserve a break or you have done well enough or you're lovable just the way you are. So the idea is to not fall back into the pathological um, sort of coping mechanism, if you like, or into the toxic critic messages. So there are triggers, but how do you cope with those triggers? How do you react to that trigger? Will break the chain or will reinforce the chain of schema, maladaptive schemas um, uh, is one way of looking at it. Yes, I just realized. Thank you, Aparna. That's very useful. And it's, it's actually uh, uh, quite useful to address it as it's happening because sometimes when they bring only past issues, it's like, you know, it's happened. How much longer can I keep blaming my parents? But when it's happening now, it's actually helpful to give them some tools and reinforce them so they can address it as it's happening. There's another question for you, Aparna, while I got you. Uh, in terms of uh, maladaptive schemas, if there are other comorbidities like substance, alcohol, over uh, active sexual activity. Is there a recommendation to have simultaneous work for that? Or do you do one over the other? Uh, any response to that? Um, I suppose there, there has to be a level of commitment to therapy. If the person comes in intoxicated most times or is DNAing because they're <laughs> mostly having other ways of dealing with things, then it's very therapy interfering. But if it's happening on the side, it becomes part of the coping mode or the impulsive, angry child part. And I think schema therapy embeds in itself a way of accommodating it, but still challenging it. Um, it's as pathological as someone coming and being in a very pseudo intellectual state and waffling off. So mm -hmm. you, you can always look at the pros and cons of it. And uh, I'm just trying to think of... Um, an example that can bring in substance misuse. But coping modes come in all kinds of shapes and forms. Uh, the most recent BPD patient that I had, had um, her coping mode was more of overcompensating, overpleasing others, because she got the message that her needs were too much. Um, so addressing the, the critic part of her inadvertently took care of the coping. 
Mm-hmm. So instead of her really getting the message that my emotions are too much, therefore I must be damaged and bad, by addressing that part, you know, she found it less needing to go into approval seeking and less needing to go into overcompensating. So I wonder, you know, though it may not be targeted coping mode work, the work around critic, the work around in a child wow. itself, that's made her agenda. less needing to go into the coping. So whether that happens with drug and alcohol as well, it's a self-soother. The term that's used in coping mode is self-soother for eating um, alcohol, drugs, all those, I mean, uh, mindless browsing that <laughs> I often that find myself doing. doing. Yes. <laughs> so, you know, uh, that's your coping mode. And, uh, you know, would you, would you do that less if you've actually nurtured your inner child and mm-hmm. had a little bit more space from that critic, which is really bombarding you off. So, yeah. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, I'll go to the raised hands now. Kanika, do you want to introduce yourself and ask your question? Can I also ask people to uh, switch on your videos? I'm going to take a quick screenshot while we're talking. Let me change the name first. Oh, yeah, it gets spotlighted, right? take off our spotlight so we have more videos on. Kanika, you can carry on. Don't, don't be distracted okay. by this. Okay. Okay. So I'm Kanika. I'm, uh, uh, I practice an eclectic approach and uh, I have like interest in attachment uh, interventions and experiential work. Um, I'm lead clinical psychologist at Doc Vita. And my question is, and one thing before I ask question is like, I'm feeling very nostalgic because Nita ma'am is here. So it's really going back to college again. So thank you, ma'am. And uh, my question was one, um, what Avinash sir asked is, uh, uh, coming back to therapy was something that I was thinking about in a terms of a lot of times my clients, especially UPD, uh, said that at that time it didn't make sense. And now the context telling me that it is like now I'm at a place where I can work further. And that somewhere also depend on which where on motivational cycle they were at that time. Obviously that changed because of the context. At that time, they were maybe at a contemplation place and they were thinking about like, oh, should I do this or not? But now, and because it's circular in nature, they they did the progress. And then they were like, okay, there was something in the spiral that was missing and now I want to come back to. And at that time, I was thinking like um, accepting the cl- uh, client at that they have the expertise of their experiences as well. And starting where they want to because again uh, um, uh, even Ashlesha ma'am said that we need to drop down the expertise stance at times and give the space to the client that okay they know it better because they also learn a lot so in this aspect uh, where do we fit which aspect of therapy basically that's what my question uh, I had like small, small questions that all the discussion, I'm so sorry. Like, should I go together or like one by one? Just two, three questions I had. Okay, let's uh, address one. We are kind of okay. out of time for addressing all okay. of them. So maybe what you can do is choose the most important one that needs to be addressed and we'll definitely address that. But can we, okay. does anyone have a response to, you know, So, what, if I understand your question correctly, what you're saying is that if we have to drop our expert stand where do we meet them at how do we decide what point to meet them and uh, when are we kind of because if they're at high risk we have to become an expert and manage the risk so how do we understand dropping the, the expert stance is that what you're asking yeah yeah but uh, again coming back to therapy a lot of clients come back after a year of uh, leaving the therapy and in between uh, a kind of an update i'm receiving through mail and everything but they're like, okay, now this is a context. Now I want to work, but I want to work on this aspect because now my context is allowing me to work on this context. We discussed about about it. I cognitively understood that now. So this is my, so at that time we will give uh, priority to the client uh, or uh, priority to our expert stance at that moment. Hmm. Does anyone want to respond to that? 
I can respond if you don't want to, but I'm happy for each of you to respond. I was wondering whether it has to be one or the other. Um, whether it, it, somehow it feels like we're getting into like a binary position that as if what the therapist needs and what the person or the client needs is somehow um, very different or cannot align or something like that. And maybe a review or it, depending on how every person's practices can help clarify some of those things look at what happened in the first course of therapy what has it been since what's going on now what's the need now and then offer I think there, there, there have been discussions about whether you know sometimes does someone need a different approach or is it more of the same approach maybe the goals are different because I find that I kind of related with what uh, Aparna was saying about booster sessions. I think we that I do that sometimes where we might contract fewer sessions and sometimes and very often build on the same understanding actually, but mm. we might be adding things or the same thing could look different. Mm. And uh, something about, yes, maybe where they, they might be on the more, like you were talking about motivation. So somebody might be ready yeah. to go a bit further this time. Or, yeah, so that's how I would approach it. And maybe it doesn't have to become one or the other. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, MBT, definitely what you would do is you would be curious about why they want to address something now, right? So if they say, oh, I've understood this and I didn't understand it then, now I'll do more justice to the therapy. So let's talk about this, right? Mm -hmm. So they have come with an agenda, maybe with a cognitive understanding, but not based on their current requirement. So you don't, I mean, at least I can tell you from an MBT point, and I'm guessing it will be similar to other therapies. You don't necessarily start off with your expert understanding that I don't think you need it right now. You still start mm -hmm. with what they're coming with. How come you need this now? Become curious, explore it further. And once you've explored it, you kind of then collaboratively can figure out whether this is what they need or not. Because when you become curious, your expert stance might shift a little. You might say, oh, I thought they didn't need it, but it looks like they do. Right? So mm -hmm. I think that's the kind of, uh, that's the shift in the expertise. You're not necessarily not being an expert. You're just staying curious. So you help them reach your space rather than you say, okay, I don't think that's reality. This is what you need. Does that help uh, Kanika in understanding? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Even I had that stance only. I just wanted to be clear. Just one more question about, uh, uh, Dharni was talking about, and I want a clarification uh, uh, more of that that uh, the skills, uh, the limitations when we were talking about mentalization, that the skills were uh, uh, for regulating the client. It's not there and uh, it has to be borrowed. What I understand about, uh, and please correct me if I'm wrong, that the process of mentalization therapy also helps in that the relational work uh, kind of also helps in anchoring the uh, client that, okay, uh, I know, um, it's very uh, sad and this is this is what i feel uh, when you are saying that when they see that their need are getting uh, validated at that time that is also a grounding uh, skill it's not mentioned but the process of mentalization therapy actually provide those skills i just wanted a clarification on that absolutely you know you're right and i feel like i mean i i, I this was a provocative question i wanted people to recognize that there are limitations because so this is the limitation we've experienced. So for example, if a client dysregulates in front of us when you're doing MBT, I may or may not tell them, take a deep breath. You know, I may, not, I may or may not tell them, find something to hold, look at something, spend some time. I may not yeah. specify those tools for them. I might just say, okay, it's okay. Take your time to calm down. Whatever you want, I'll wait. So in yeah. MBT, we are not going to keep working on them and giving them tools, but we're going to wait. We're going to be the sort of, empathetically validating be calm when they are dysregulated so that they you know you're not adding to their more dysregulation or not saying okay. things like not be invalidated so you are doing that process but in uh it can be a limitation because sometimes clients say but i don't know how to like if i say it's okay take your time i'll wait till you calm down and they say but i don't know how to you have to teach me and that's where for some in, in some people require that explicit teaching of skills and so that's not explicitly yeah. defined in MBT. It just says whatever the, you have access to. So it also gives freedom to the therapist. Okay, if yeah. you want to teach them some skills, you can. 
right? Mm -hmm. And what, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if there's a clip that is out there in YouTube, which I've shown in MBT trainings, where uh, uh, Professor Bateman is interviewing a client who, you know, is a bit flustered. And all he's doing is not allowing him to keep talking when he's flustered. It's like, it's okay. You know, take your time. You look a little upset. When you're ready, we'll talk. So not mm -hmm. allowing that come going on, getting flustered so that they build up on that cycle and they start spiraling, just helping mm -hmm. them to stay where they are and using whatever tools they have. So that is, that is the process and it definitely helps. But sometimes it can be a limitation if their client wants a tool if the client feels like the first they need to be taught the tools, then you go to the process. So it can be a limitation in that aspect, but it's it's not necessarily a limitation if uh, understood together by the client and the therapist from beginning. Does that help? In an, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any, uh, Apurva, you had your hand up and it's gone down. Do you want to ask your question? Yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Apurva Shetty. I'm a clinical psychologist. I uh, have been working with the Green Oak Initiative for the past two years now. Previously, I was at Nimhan, so I did my MPhil there. So um, because it's 1.20, I'm pretty sure everyone's hungry at this point. <laughs> I will make this a reflection and not a question. So I think... Um, when we talk about research in BPD, I think we have to look at it slightly differently because uh, there are significant problems when we talk about evidence-based or um, you know uh, quantitative research because when we're looking at efficacy, effectiveness, there are limitations in terms of how most researchers look at uh, interventions for a period of one year not the max. So one may wonder what happens to these clients after a couple of years in terms of their sense of self, in, th in terms of their identity diffusion, in terms of uh, their interpersonal relationships as well. So who do they see uh, they are and also the kind of value they have in other relationships as well. These are things that you don't often see in research studies and the way they have been portrayed as well. And I feel like Moving forward, we might want to think about how we you know, may conduct research in that sense, um, especially when I've seen a lot of my own clients, BPD clients, and or most of my clients have had at least two to three therapists before. So, um, so what's going on in longitudinally? What has gone on for this client, especially the adolescent client uh, who's been through therapy at the age of 15? What happens to this client at 35? What happens to this client at 28, right? So these are some things that we really don't talk about when we're talking about evidence-based, right? Or most of the research and the conclusion, you'll see this was better than that, or MBT was proven to be better than DBT, or DBT was proven to be better than MBT. I feel like that could be potentially harmful going forward. Um, the, the last thing I want to say is as professionals and perhaps even trainees, uh, we, we kind of, I'm kind of coming to this conclusion that we're looking at incorporating different approaches to suit different clients, but at the same time, we're also working towards an approach that makes sense to us. So it's a dialectic in that sense. So we, are like Nita Ma'am talk, talked about, so we ourselves are stuck, aren't we? So this is my, you know, problem as well. And I am that teammate who is very reluctant to <laughs> stick to stick to one approach. I'm the eclectic one. So uh, I think we have to think about these things going forward. Um, so yeah. Thanks, yes. Park and Anastasia. Thank you so much, uh, Purva, for uh, really nicely summing it up. And saying that, you know, evidence definitely, I definitely agree with you. Uh, not only research in BPD uh, and its limitations, but research in India and its limitations. You know, are the research in India in, uh, in therapy approaches and its adaptive models? And, you know, what does it look like? What will it look like? Are we able to do better research in India? Because the outcome measures, for example, in some research, uh, evidence that comes from overseas is reduced presentation to hospitals. But the, that that outcome measure may or may not be relevant in, in Indian settings because they may not even be presenting to hospitals much. They may be presenting to clinics or, you know, they may be having uh, disrupted relationships. So I think evidence, uh, maybe this is a good sort of uh, cue for uh, all of you clinicians in India is to think of doing more research, different kinds of research, qualitative research of therapy approaches, because that is what we need more of so that we can really start answering this question 
you know, what works, what, 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 how true are we to our style and does that really matter or not? Um, in terms of, and I'm, I'm going to wrap up now. I know, I don't know if you have any other questions, please uh, don't hesitate to email us. There are a couple of questions that were there, which I haven't fully addressed and I will respond to it by email. I will be sending you resources that uh, every, all the panelists have shared. Um, but one of the things that I, I kind of, I'm so grateful to all of you, uh, the panelists and the participants for, uh, you know, bearing with this kind of uh, process, because really what I wanted to highlight is that uh, it's not one size fits all. Our clients are different. We are different. And our clients may be at different stages in their life. Sometimes they may need DBT. Sometimes they may need CAT, you know, so they, they might need uh, something else. And my counter to Apurva is, you know, I, I, feel like I will have my limitations. I'll be able to do only so much for my client. And then if they need something else, then maybe someone else is better placed to provide that. And that doesn't mean that I, I, I can't be flexible. I should try and be flexible, but I should also try and recognize they need something else that I may not be able to provide. Um, it's, it's difficult in Indian setting to send them to someone else. They build the trust with you. They don't want to go to anyone else, but if they know that we are working together. So that is really the highlight that we work collaboratively we're not saying, okay, you know, that therapist was terrible. Forget about, uh, you know, that therapy. I'm going to do something better. We're not doing that. And with BPD, I've kind of learned to accept that, you know, maybe they need different experiences. The first one might be a little bit corrective, but not so much. They might have to reject them, you know, feel uh, rejected by them. Then they go to the next one where they won't be so dysregulated. And maybe that bit of work that you did, even if it was for a short time and the client left you, that was some value, something came out of that that helped them. So often we are probably a part in their journey. We may not be able to do everything for them. And that also is quite helpful to think of. Um, and really uh, what I took away from today was that there is a lot of um, shared understanding. I think all of you talked about like, you know, I'm not the expert who's going to just teach my clients things. We are together going to explore. and. Uh, we really are going to work together with the client. We are we're going to work either short term or long term, but we're going to work together. And there is a lot of similarity. So we are not all, you know, rushing off in different directions. We are working on a similar uh, framework and we are using different styles to help our client. And I think it's, it's actually a good thing that we have more different kind of uh, therapies rather than only one approach, because then we'll be stuck because our clients may not want just one approach. So I'm really glad that we were able to listen to different approaches. And uh, thank you, everyone, for sticking it out well past the time. Thank you to the panelists. And uh, we will be sharing the recording online. We'll uh, let you know when it's ready. If you have any other questions that come up from this webinar, please don't hesitate to email us. Uh, thank you once again. And goodbye. Have a good uh, rest of Sunday. Thanks, Ash. Cheers. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. I'm going to end the meeting. Then. You are recording? Yeah.